Welcome to the Cherry Picker, the horror movie podcast where we like to kill people, but not really. I'm your host, Zach Cherry, and with me, as always, is... Fuck you! Eddie of Edward is Truth. And <laughs> today, it's it's all about Scream 2. <laughs> Scream, the sequel. Uh, do you want yeah, to do you want to lead us in with a synopsis? Not really. I'm not really feeling it tonight, but I will anyway. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> After Windsor College seniors Phil Stevens and Maureen Evans are killed by the masked mystery killer now known as Ghostface. At a sneak preview of Stab, a scary movie based on the events of the Woodsboro Massacre. The news media and ruthless reporter Gail Weathers descend on Windsor College, where already legendary fighter Sidney Prescott and her cinephile and fellow Woodsboro survivor, Randy Meeks, team up with lovable police officer, Dewey Riley, and a whole new lineup of friends slash suspects to determine who is unhinged enough to attempt to stage a sequel. And will this ghost face make them all scream too? <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Yeah, uh, I know. Scream too. <laughs> scream as well. Scream again. Uh, I forgot to mention. Released December 12th, 1997. So we're coming up on the 25th anniversary. My God. Did you see this in the theater? No. Me either. Um, yeah. Um, no, I uh, I don't think I saw one in the theater until Scriforum. Um, oh, wow. You're a late But loomer. I did. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it just, I don't know. I just, mm, I don't know. I, I, I don't ask me. Yeah. But, I, but um, no, I remember when I saw it, 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 it's always had the same effect on me from the get-go like once once it opens up i think it's one of the um especially considering like its place in the franchise like the wit and <laughs> the self refer the wit of the self-referential quality the way we dive into it right from right from the beginning is unparalleled i think because i don't know if this is the first movie sequel to reference itself by making a movie about what happened in the first movie, yeah. the only movie prior, and satirize it. I, I can't, I've never found another example. If anybody knows of any, please DM me or something. Maybe did Demons 2? Did it make did... a movie about the first Demons in the... Like, but like I a don't different remember. movie? I, like not and I watched it recently, movie? but it's... Because uh, the first one is like set in a movie theater and they're watching... Right. The movie in, in that, but then the second one takes place in an apartment building. It's it's like this high school girl's birthday party, and right. there's a movie playing on TV, and I'm not sure if it's the same one. I don't uh, know. But, even Season of the Witch like <clears throat> had the first Halloween movie in it yeah. as a movie, but they didn't satirize it. They didn't have somebody else playing Michael yeah. Myers and doing a very bad job the way like, you know, or a really bad Jamie Lee Curtis like Heather Graham is <laughs> Casey Becker. Oh my gosh, who would be who would be like the stab equivalent of Jamie Lee Curtis? Oh my god. Well, it depends I guess on I mean, if it were made the same time Halloween 2 was me or yeah. early 80s? Hmm, ooh. That's a good question. Oh, Pia Zadora. <laughs> no idea who that Okay. Is. See, that's why she'd be great. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I did want to say, uh, yeah, because I did not get to see this when it came out in the theater. No. Uh, and it wasn't for a lack of trying because mm. um, uh, Ontario, like where, where I grew up uh, in Toronto, they were a lot stricter with uh, like movie releases, just in terms of 
who can get in to see them. And uh, oh. it was like 12 or 13 at the time. 12 I, would be um, in 97. And um, I remember like I went with my mom. Like I'm just like, I really want to see this. Can you take me? Because like you'd have to at least like have an adult with you. But this, yeah. they were mm-hmm. like, no, like no, no kids can see this at all. Like it basically like the equivalent of NC-17, I guess, which was ridiculous wow. which was weird yeah because like the the movie theater um rating system was different from like the home media system and oh. even for like canadian ratings so i was just like right. yeah i don't see how that works so i was really bummed out because like we like we were gonna go opening night and i remember like huge lineup and i mean i'm sure like if if i had been younger i probably would have cried like i would have like right then and there but um, I, mean, I, I think we movie. like the uh, <laughs> the consolation was that we went to see Spice World instead, which I had already seen. So oh. rather than seeing Scream Two, I, I saw Spice World again. Oh. Two Spice World, T O O, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't end up seeing Scream Two until it uh, released on on home media. Um, but luckily, I think the only thing that got, was spoiled for me because of, like, classmates who... I don't even know if they saw it, but, like, they had siblings who were older who told them, and then they went to school, and they're just like, oh, yeah, Randy dies. And it's just like... Oh, my God! Yeah. So that, that was actually... That was so something that was spoiled mean. for Because I already had the first movie, uh, just in terms of, like, Billy and Stu being the killers spoiled. But I didn't know yeah, who the killers were. I didn't know that it was no. uh, Mickey and Mrs. Loomis, uh, or that, like... Laurie Metcalf was playing uh, Billy's mom, so at least that was kind of fresh for me. Because I even remember that the the climax when uh, Mickey is just like, "Told you I gotta, I have to." That told you I gotta have a partner, and you see Gail uh, walk through the door, and from that like no. split second, you're thinking like, "Holy shit!" Like it was Gail. Yeah. Like forgetting yeah, that yeah, she and was. That, which... <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Forgetting that she was just with um, Debbie Salt. Dewey. Well, no, Debbie yeah, Salt. And Debbie Salt, yeah, but also with Dewey, like, watching him die and cry about it. Like, yeah. why would she be a ghost face and then be like, mm-hmm. no, this wasn't supposed to happen, mm-hmm. but I'm still too scared to get out of the room. Like, but I had that <gasps> moment, too, the first time I like, saw how it. how could yeah, you? But, <laughs> But just because I'm such a movie's bitch, you know, like, I mean, yeah. if it's well done enough, if I'm enough on the ride, then I'll buy anything and I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll be right there ready yeah. to be duped and manipulated. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so that that was that. Um, but I almost like it, I, I could only imagine how surreal it would feel like seeing this in the movie theater with that opening mm-hmm. scene, because yeah. like that. I don't know if I have seen, like, because I've seen tons of movies that are set in movie theaters, but I've never seen, like, them in movie theaters. Um, so I, I, <laughs> I, I could just imagine, like, that would be crazy. And who knows, like, I don't think that any moviegoers would have been dressed up as Ghostface while they were there no. or that they were, like, giving out costumes. But, I mean, even that opening, like, the that theater experience that we see in the movie, like, I would want to be there. I mean, like minus the the bloody homicide but i mean like that just seems like a really <laughs> cool time like you you're they're giving out free costumes it's like a sneak preview of uh, this movie everyone is just like really into it people are fucking like no. running around going crazy and Not i'm the you. exact opposite yeah. like i see well i see that movie theater and it's akin to like the movie theater where they were debuting um oh what movie were they showing i think it was uh bride of the monster <laughs> in uh, Ed Wood, when all the kids are just throwing shit at Bella Lugosi and Vampira, and just, you know, chaos is going on. And like, it's just like, shut the fuck up and sit down and watch the movie. I would have just left. If I would have gone to a movie theater and it would have been like that, I would have been like, I'm trying to watch the goddamn movie. Will you shut the fuck up? And um, ironically, I find uh, Maureen, uh, Jada Pinkett's uh, character, um, to be probably the least distracting audience member <laughs> of them all. And she full on climbs up onto the stage and screams. Yeah. Well, there's and even that dies. bit where, because like everyone's just being super obnoxious and then she's just like, bitch, hang the phone up and star 69 his ass. And then everyone's like, oh, I love Shh. that. And it's just like, what the, f- so what, what's this double standard, you know? <laughs> 
I mean, I'm all for an interactive audience, but that's the thing. It's like you got to be interactive. You got to be focused on the movie, and they have to be. They have to choose their moments, like to say something when they know somebody isn't saying something, so nobody misses a line yeah. or a comedic beat, which is even worse. And so we all, you know, it, it can add to the performance, not to the performance, but you know, the perform here, like I'm in theater. But I mean, it can add to the experience, but it can. Um, but there are too many people who don't know how to do it with with tact and yeah. with uh, a kind of regard for people. They're doing it more to kind of show off rather than to entertain the people. Because yeah. entertaining us means letting us watch the damn movie also. But, um, yeah, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say that they actually, like with Stab, like that opening scene with Heather Graham, like they shot like a whole bunch of shit. Like there's probably like a full movie there. I don't yeah. know if like there would be, yeah. I don't know if there's like a Steve actor because they didn't really show us that but like there's probably like tons of footage that exists out there uh and i would love to see like an extended like if they you know they're so stingy with special features on like any screen release like they just released like the 25th anniversary uh steel book uh 4k for for the original and just like that's that's all Mm. you put on there like go like give us a little more like it's 25 years but i mean like because there's there's tons of scenes from the first movie not tons but there are things that are deleted like there was extra stuff uh, of sydney and tatum in the grocery store and i know that there's more that's deleted here because there are bloopers on at least the original dvd that i have that show more scenes with uh sydney and mickey so i mean like for a lot of people who are like annoyed that like mickey didn't have a lot of screen time before his reveal i mean like that could have been, you know, the the thing that that swayed your decision on him, maybe. But uh, <laughs> but I was going to say because, uh, uh, and, and just in case anyone didn't know, the all of these scenes in Stab were directed by Robert Rodriguez, and that yeah. wasn't that wasn't made fully canon in in no. the Scream franchise until Scream Four when when we saw the the credits uh, at the uh, Stabathon. Yeah. Yes, no, it was not. It, it, it was not uh, uh, common knowledge uh, at the time. I don't mm-hmm. think. I think. I think the first person I heard about it from was my oldest friend, John Carlos. But I do appreciate what what he put into it in terms of just like the overblown thunderstorm juxtaposed with the <laughs> underwhelming acting that yeah. Heather Graham is offering. And I'm not a ta- I'm not coming for Heather Graham. I like her a lot, but I just love the blank wayfish kind of stare. She just got this placid kind of is the water ready for my shower? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just so blank. And even the way she answers the phone, "Hello." You know, <laughs> it's the blankest. I feel like she was giving Kind of like what Julianne Moore was giving in Boogie Nights with her horrible acting. I feel like this was. <laughs> I thought you were going to say <laughs> she was doing uh, like Julianne Moore, Clarice Starling, but. Um... No! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's not my Clarice, which we'll get into whenever we talk about Hannibal, but, but I don't think she's bad in it. Yeah. But, um... <laughs> but um, also just. I love the, the that it took me this long. I think I, th- I think we might have talked about it off pod at some point, but I'm constantly reminded that um, the stall that Phil hears, um, uh, like things going on. I remember my first perception is kind of what I stick to, and I always thought it was just like two people uh, getting it on in a stall, and that's why he wanted to listen to it and everything. Mm-hmm. But if you listen carefully, or if you watch it with like the subtitles, you can see that it's um, somebody saying all these things to mommy in an echo of Billy from Black Christmas. And one thing that I love about that is the fact that a, a reference is being made to a character named Billy in another franchise mm-hmm. by someone <laughs> who is associated with someone who was associated with Billy from this franchise of the first yeah. movie. I just felt like it was a lovely kind of, and, it's saying mommy. You and know? not only it that, but, it, but almost like kind of like a very subtle hint towards yeah. the the uh, reveal. And this, I, I, I want to mention this, uh, and this I'm not, uh, hopefully I'm not like throwing anyone under the bus because someone did comment on uh, my YouTube today and they were just uh, saying how, I, I think they said Scream 2 was their least favorite. And we'll get into that more later, um, but they, sure. they said uh, Scream 2 was their least favorite um, because it didn't, there was no clues, like there was nothing to really like point towards uh, 
Mrs. Loomis at the end, and I'm, and I'm just like, that's not true at all. Like, there's you you have the scene of like another stab scene later on with uh, Tori Spelling <laughs> and Luke Wilson, where they directly reference the one scene from the original movie where Mrs. Loomis is referenced, where they bring yeah. her, say how she she left town, and then immediately after that, Dewey and Randy proceed to throw out suspects, and he references. Mrs. Voorhees is a terrific serial killer. Yeah. Um, so it's like they're there. Like they're, there's there's little clues, which which I think is really neat. And and, and just going back to the, uh, well, really the whole movie, but, but especially the beginning, because I love how, because this is my favorite movie of the franchise other than the original. This, this is my favorite sequel, because mm. I feel that this is the most unique and that's a, a criticism that I hear. I guess we'll just get right into this now. Uh, a criticism that I hear for this movie of like all the the like the dissenters that that consider this to be the worst is that it's just the same movie over as the first Scream. And I could not disagree more. I even heard um, uh, Dead Meat. They said it uh, on a, on a podcast. Uh, I don't I, I don't know if it was both of them, but they, yeah, they're they're just like yeah. The thing with Scream Two is it just feels like it's the same thing as Scream One. And I'm just like no, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's I I I don't like other than maybe the Sarah Michelle Geller scene being mm-hmm. somewhat of an abridged version of the Drew Barrymore scene. Nothing sure. here really like it, it's a completely different environment, like a, a different setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of the characters who have at least survived have kind of matured a little. You know, we, we, we have more mm-hmm. development with them. We're referencing new movies, and that's, that's what I wanted to say. Like, uh, like, I love how this movie goes on to make references to other movies, and not just, like, by name-dropping them, but just, like, paying homage, because every movie other than this one, the opening scene is someone picking up a telephone. And mm. I mean, that's classic. Like that's a staple of Scream. And that's why, you know, we do get that with the with the Sarah Michelle Gellar scene. But I love yeah. the fact that the opening does take place in a movie theater because it's, it's like the complete opposite of what we had in the first movie where it's like, mm. you know, you've got Drew Barrymore home alone, isolated in the yeah. middle of nowhere. And now we have two people who are in a public place surrounded by people and that's the thing like you watch this and you're just like what's gonna happen like even the first time i saw this like is who who's gonna get murdered here like there's there's people all over the place and they're just like oh that's how they're gonna do it and they and this is like what kevin williamson is doing because he's referencing movies besides um uh, uh, uh when a stranger calls because that was kind of the uh the basis for the, the Drew Barrymore scene. So here, uh, he he's referencing a movie called uh, He Knows You're Alone, uh, mm-hmm. which ha- has an opening scene that does involve a very similar movie theater murder. It even has like a little bit where there's like a scene in a in a bathroom, uh, oh. which which does not in- completely echo it. But uh, yeah, there's yeah. there's there's all these different things. Even in the movie theater itself, like you've got the 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 references to William Castle films like we talked about yeah. this before with Thirteen Ghosts but like you've got the 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 flying ghost faces which are like the yes. the, the flying skeletons uh, yeah. from House on Haunted Hill and the the stabo vision or whatever it said <laughs> so it's just like there's it this is to me it feels a lot more alive than the other sequels because it's Kevin Williamson just being like okay now I've I've already like shown off like all these obscure movies that I know and love that, you know, a lot of people don't know. And now I'm going to like reach into, you know, my, my reference guide of all these other movies and use those. And that's why I feel like if he had continued going, uh, into like scream three and, you know, maybe had more control over the script in scream four that we would have seen like this litany of, of so many different movies and just, and just been more creative because the, and, and not to get, too much into Scream 4 here because the original opening of that movie was supposed to deal with Sydney being at a dinner party, oh, right. which mm-hmm. uh, then all of the dinner guests would, would have been murdered and then it would have like continued on several years later. But that's, again, that's so much different than, you know, what we did get, which was just like the phone call all over again. Like, and the same with, mm-hmm. with Cotton in, in Scream 3. So mm-hmm. get, get, getting back to, to what I was saying, this is, to me, so far removed from the original because 
Kevin Williamson is is delving into new territory. Nothing feels repetitive uh-huh. to me here. Maybe like it hits the same beats, but I mean, all of these movies do. So there, it's not really, to me, it, it, it doesn't feel repetitive. Well, I also appreciate the fact, I agree with you. I don't think it feels repetitive at all. I mean, even the fact that's, and that's a real skill. The fact that they are satirizing the first scene of the first movie and the first scene of the second movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that I, what I love about it is I get what is happening while I'm watching it. I get every reference to what they got right, which is like her hair, but what they got wrong or what they, you know, zhuzhed up for the Hollywood of it all. Like the fact that Ghostface is on the roof looking through a skylight and the thunderstorm and the thigh lightning mm-hmm. crack and, you know, all that stuff. But, um, <laughs> and even like. Her kind of, you know, stupidity of just like, you know, I don't even know you, but I dislike you already. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I feel like the whole but, thing, uh, like, the, like the whole like Robert Rodriguez vision of it, which I'm sure was a direction mm-hmm. from Wes Craven, yeah. was just like, yeah. make like a really exaggerated version of, you know, what we had done in the original. Like, don't it like, you know, you because you sure. do have the lightning storm and, and all this mm-hmm. shit. So it's it, it completely intentional. Like, there, this was not meant to be a good film but it's still a film that i want to see oh i would too but what i but what i also uh uh, what's interesting and maybe this i i I don't know if i'm gonna make an argument for the people who are saying this is lower on their roster even though it is lower on the roster for me but we'll get into that later Mm -hmm. but um i do what i really appreciate uh, appreciate about the opening is um the fact that like I pointed out the wit and everything like that, but what probably works less for me that I miss from the first movie is the scare of it all. Like the layering Mm -hmm. of the tension and everything. I don't feel Mm -hmm. tension the same way in this movie because it's, it's kind of got the ball ball rolling. I think when we talked about the first movie, we talked about how legitimately scary it opened. And then the self-referential stuff that was, humorous that we were supposed to laugh at came kind of like with those kids in the courtyard and everything like that. Did you find her liver in the mailbox? Because I, you know, next to her (laughs) spleen and her pancreas and all that stuff. Um, That shit's funny. (laughs) It's definitely like, this is a more, it's not scary. It's, but it's fun. And it's probably like the most fun of like any of the openings to me. And I even like, I, I, I've noticed this, like the, um, the way in which uh, Maureen, Evans Mm. is like she's almost has this very like hyperbolic reaction to the movie and the like when she goes out into the lobby and hears the jump scares and she just like she jolts and and spins around. It's just like like give it a rest. Like you're like nobody is that scared of I mean I shouldn't say that because people do genuinely, you know, find terror in 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 scary movies. Um, People get but, irrational, yeah. But I mean, like, even that scene itself, because there's, like, the two girls behind her in the line, and they're just like, I'm not going back in there. Like, this actually yeah, happened yeah. in real life. And it's just yeah. like, well, then yeah. why are you getting popcorn? Like, why are you leaving the theater? <laughs> <laughs> She's just waiting to be argued back. You know, like, she'll get her popcorn, and then she'll be like, okay, it's probably half over by now anyway. Yeah. But, um, I, Which is what, kind what of do... like Jada's, uh, or, like, her character's uh, <laughs> rationale. She's just like, Ah, uh, Sandra already started. Let's just let's just watch this. Show. Yeah, right. <laughs> but then she gets into it, which I actually really appreciate. Where she's just kind of like, you know, looks like she's about to get it. You want some? Or she's popcorn? like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 don't do that. <laughs> and everything. I love her. Yeah. But um, also, but see, even then, like, um, I think what gets to me, even though it's not s- scary, scary, like it doesn't chill me or you know make me go or anything. But I do. Mm-hmm. It does play on my empathy which is when she first discovers the blood on her hands and then she gets stabbed and the way the veins form in her forehead mm-hmm. and the way the blood just kind of, she's coughing blood and and the way she like um talk about jolts like she yeah. is full on almost um like seizuring or something like as he is continually stabbing her mar- walking her down that aisle and everybody yeah. is just going mad for it and then when she stands on the stage what i love is it's, partic- it's not everybody but one by one you start to see it kind of registering on the faces of the crowd mm-hmm. people start kind of realizing one by one shit, is this real, you know? And then there were people still alongside them who were cheering, mm-hmm. which feels incredibly realistic. But then I just thought it was the a publicity look, the gr- 
Yeah, but just the And it would have been a good one too. After she screams. But no, after she screams. <laughs> and and just looks well, she... does that grimace with the blood on her teeth and yeah. then collapses. It feels so sad. You, well, I love it. She I, I guess like had a conversations with Wes obviously beforehand. Uh, but she was just like, I wanna like die the most painful death. Like, she was, like, really into the idea of it. And he was just like, okay, we can do that. And you just see, like, Wes yeah. Craven just being like, hmm, hmm, yeah. You're in the right Okay, movie. yeah, okay, I, I think we can do that. Because <laughs> there's a lot of, if not deaths, there yeah. are certainly a lot of emotional uh, attacks, shall we say, or stabs in this movie yeah. that, that, that ha- especially when they're happening to the core characters, mm-hmm. oh, my God, did they Well, there's definitely, like, I mean, I would say... Well, obviously, I, I feel like the, for the most part, the Scream movies have gotten progressively more violent as they go on, Scream 3 notwithstanding. Uh, but this definitely, yeah. like, just just uh, to, to echo Randy's line later on when he says, like, the, you know, the deaths have to be bigger and more elaborate, that they yes. definitely, like, there's, there's so much more. You've got the pull through the head uh, as, you know, and his hand... Uh, shaking with 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 the gun and and all and of course the the movie theater scene so uh they definitely outdo themselves in the the gore factor for scream 2 yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, oh sorry this is just like random thought because you mentioned debbie salt earlier and like the clues and everything like that another thing that hit struck me for the first time in the screening while i was taking notes for this pod i love that she, one of the first things out of her mouth while she's talking with Gail when she gets introduced into the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even remember the whole line. I just wrote it real fast in quotes. Violence and cinema issues where she's talking about mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, you have partnered <laughs> who has the most violence and cinema issues. He is the, like, he's going to, he wants to become the poster boy mm-hmm. for violence and cinema issues. <laughs> and I just love like the mask of it all. Like the fact that she's layering in also this very Wes Craven uh, mentality mm-hmm. he always was very anti censorship of his films obviously and made references in interviews to like when they when you get notes from the MPAA or even from the studio uh, yeah. about like you know things that they want you to excise from your film that you worked so hard to create and it's like giving imagine giving birth to a child and you hand and the doctor has just given birth to it and now he's responsible for cleaning it and making sure that it can go yeah. into the world and you know grow but he starts deciding you know what he doesn't need these many fingers or these toes. I'm going to start clipping them off. And it's like, no, oh, what are you doing? And I, yeah. That should um. have been a, a clue to let us know that just like, you know, all the good guys, all like the cool characters are the ones that are like, you know, clearly like Gail's like no comment. Um, but the ones yeah. who are actually, because you, like you pointed out, and I never even thought about that, is that uh, Mrs. Loomis was layering the eventual uh. like framing of Mickey of just, of, of like the violence in cinema thing. So just like, of course... The, the two characters who speak out about violence. Uh-huh. I mean, they're not the only two, but I mean, like, of the main cast, I think yeah. Mickey and Mrs. Loomis are probably the only two who who outright do say they have uh, issues with, with violence in cinema. Yeah, that is so moral yeah. majority. <laughs> Just quoting CC. CC. <laughs> yeah. That is so moral majority. You can't blame real-life violence on cinema. Uh, also, or in the why, movies. Why, what? <laughs> right. Why does Randy get the aliens quote wrong? I yeah. I mean that's that's always been something that it irks me just a little bit. And I think that <laughs> from what I understand, that he like Jamie Kennedy got it wrong, but they that was just the best take that they had. Oh man! So because <laughs> that so was bad. a reshoot, right? Because the original scene was actually right. just uh, Timothy Oliphant and. Uh, Jamie Kennedy and it was like a completely different set and there was like all these students but it was just really them back and forth so that's when Wes wanted to to, like decide yeah they're just like okay we need to have more interaction here let's also throw (laughs) Sarah Michelle Gellar in there because they didn't have her in more of the like they just had her in her scene there's other scenes with Sarah Michelle Gellar like you see her in the back of like background of the quad when everyone's walking around and I guess there was more that's another thing like more scenes that are out there that should be added to like special features. Like I want to see that, that's that bit with, with Cece yeah. because she did have interactions with uh, Lois and Murphy and apparently yeah. Wes Craven removed it because 
it it sort of made her seem unsympathetic towards Sydney because huh. they were because they were just like talking about how I guess they were like going after Sydney for their oh. it was like, like a like a rivalry of whose sorority would get her yeah we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have liked her yeah <laughs> but I mean not that we don't like <laughs> Lois and Murphy because they're such like I love them but I think for, I mean, for, for a character like Cece who you know especially later on when, yeah. when we're supposed to feel scared for her and i definitely think that like yeah. you know maybe the opening scene just going back to what we were saying before wasn't scary but i, yeah. I think that the scare factor is there for the the cc scene cc scene uh for sure <laughs> the cc scene the cc yeah, scene i i mean i don't really even feel it there either it feels a little dry oh, just because really? we know so little about her but but the thing is the 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 phone call feels a little dry but, but you know we don't memor- know we don't know anything about Casey Becker in the original either. I know, like but that. she's but because she's the first face we see on screen and mm-hmm. automatically assume she will therefore be the star of the movie. Yeah. Like I don't think anybody goes into Scream Two thinking starring Sarah Michelle Geller? Oh my no, god. No, you know? no, absolutely but. not. But I mean like I think that like Sarah Michelle Geller is on a on a caliber of of actor who can can bring it home. You know, they can yeah, you know, no, like I, paired, I love with, her t- paired with Wes Craven's direction. Yeah that, you know, she can sell it. And I definitely feel scared for her in that scene. Because even though she's not the main character, I did uh-huh. I wasn't expecting her to, <laughs> I guess, get axed so soon. Like, I thought that, like, she would right, right, definitely right. have more involvement in the mm-hmm. movie other than that. So that was a surprise. I know that when uh, she first got the script, I guess she had said to Jamie Kennedy, because they were reading it, and she just, like, got to her death. And she's just like... Wait, I'm I'm dying, and he's like, "Yeah, what did you think?" <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what movie you're in? Yeah, <laughs> you're not a member of the core, so in the core, yeah. I die too. But yeah, yeah um, no, but I and also I gotta say, just like in defense of Sarah Michelle Gellar, because I don't want it to sound like I'm attacking her or her scene. Mm. That she has some incredibly memorable, uh, considering how short the scene is. She has some incredible, incredibly memorable moments for me. Like even just like her delivery of the line, "What if I say goodbye?" You know, I'm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't say that sentence without saying it like her and thinking about her and everything yeah. like that and I mean and what, uh, even though it again it doesn't scare me but again when he like s- finally reaches her on that balcony and, and pushes the the knife and I say he because you know we went over the kill count it's over the kill yeah. list or who killed who yeah <clears throat> I think it's Mickey but um, <laughs> the fact that the knife goes into her and everything and she's like ah oh, you know I mean it's just like oh oh oh, 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 oh it's, I'm more like Jada, all of a sudden, like Maureen going, no, 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 you know, no, go, 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 we, 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 you know. Well, because we do have like the, like the running up the stairs rather than out the front door. Yes, uh, and I appreciate And those that. stairs, I mean, because she went up to like the attic and those stairs went up for days. Like it just, yes. and even like, and this is something I love because I, I, I really love them. I think this, uh, just in terms of Marco Beltrami's score, this is my favorite uh, uh, of, of, like the scores that he does as well because in that scene it's like it's it's almost like this ascent up the stairs and just like the music as it just makes it feel like you're getting <laughs> higher and higher uh just to yeah. just to emphasize the fall when it eventually does happen um yeah and since we're already talking about the scene i should also mention a cameo from selma blair on the phone Right. Yeah. <laughs> nice touch. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Selma. Come back. Yeah. You're canon. But um, <laughs> I also, um, um, in terms of, yeah, just like her getting, just to kind of like put a bow on it, um, mm-hmm. just the fact that she, when she gets thrown off the balcony, I'm not happy about it. I'm actually no. really, really sad. Like, especially when we get the Michael Myers shot of her, you know, like laying down there and then we mm-hmm. get the cleaning. The, well, not cleaning, but the wiping, shall we say, the unsuccessful wiping of the knife. Uh, that's one of the times that it happens where you see they try to wipe the blood off and it clearly does not happen. You're, but, you're just um, saying this because I posted that thing on YouTube the other day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my defense as to why the, the, the ghost face who attacks... Uh, Sydney in the next scene was this Mickey because it was the the bloodstained knife when the when it yeah but I, I, why not just pass off a knife just be like okay I'm just gonna pass you the knife because Mrs Loomis, Loomis hired him to do all the heavy lifting mm, mm, in in your canon okay so let's move <laughs> on um, <laughs> we, could, we did that we, on we, already okay we we really just jumped past like the, the oh, kind yeah, of like yeah, the yeah. character introduction because this is one of my favorite yes. parts. Of the movie. The reintroduction of the original characters, of course. And I have not, because, like, the this is, it's such an important factor of, of every one of these sequels. And I feel like this one 
gets it the best. Like they do it right because it's it's almost mm. like um the way that it's written and shot is like an Aaron Sorkin drama uh like though it's like the west wing you have like everyone yeah. walking uh in like in front of the camera as it comes by and, mm-hmm. and people are just like turning corners and then someone else will join in on the conversation you have like gail yes. weathers like emerging from the side and and just being like it's gonna be huge box office numbers like you're coming in the middle of yes. a conversation <laughs> and and i'll let you say this because you you said this before but just like how the way that dewey uh, comes into the picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's like everybody is kind of like moving into position for the movie, the real movie, the you know the prime cut of the movie yeah. to begin and everything like that. And I love that Dewey's introduction is that he's just kind of meandering, wandering, lost, looking like, could someone please show me directions to you know yeah. the original characters of Scream Two? <laughs> and, and I and thank God Sydney finds him yeah. and brings him into the movie because that oh that was another thing that was kind of rough was this was my I think this was my first time seeing Scream 2 since I've seen Five Cream Mm -hmm. and um the prospect hit me spoilers uh, oh spoilers for Five Cream yeah just in case just in case yeah I haven't seen Scream 2022 skip ahead a minute (laughs) um it starting now Um, (laughs) (laughs) um the the prospect of going into a Dewey free scream movie not because you know Mm -hmm. David Arquette can't be in it or something like that and will be in another but because they killed off his character a little heartbreaking a little hard to take especially with his little music playing when he came in I love that fucking adorable in this movie like I don't know what it is, but something about what he does with his face and his little, you know, like the way he flinches when Gail tries to touch him at one, like, ah, you know, I think it works, but it works so well with, with the music too. the, uh, well, the, uh, technically called brothers, uh, which is, uh, the theme of the movie broken arrow, which, uh, uh, composed by Hans Zimmer, which, which came out a few years before this. And they, they just used it, uh, in the test screenings and the Weinsteins liked it so much that well first they went to Beltrami and they're like can you do this like can you make this music and he's like yeah and he he made it and it was really good but they're just like no we want the we, we're just going to pay for the real the thing. thing. Like they, they paid extra money right. for, for the real thing. And I think it was the, the right choice. Not that there's anything sure. wrong with, with what Beltrami yeah. had composed, yeah. which they eventually, as we mentioned on a previous podcast, w- then became the bow theme in Cursed uh, <laughs> seven years later. Um, yeah. Oh but it, but because even then, like it, it's such a like it's such a goofy. It's it's like it's very western. Like it like it makes yes. Dewey feel like you know he's like this this like cowboy like this this outsider and you, like yeah. you were saying everyone's walking with purpose because um, there yes. is like a kind of a western quality about the the, the opening of this and then just Dewey uh, coming into the picture and like I don't know what's going on like you know if Dewey was the the star of the show. Um, but there's still echoes of like the would-be sheriff because he's wearing for a lot of, I think most of the movie, if not all of it, <laughs> largely uh, an outfit largely comprised of a similar beige to his yeah. beige. Well, that's uh, kind uniform of yeah. That's always movie. been his his color. Like that. That's another thing yeah. that I've noticed like throughout these movies is like the the wardrobe is pretty consistent. Um, I mean, of course, like you have Gail, she wears this like rainbow plethora throughout but ironically in this movie she's just kind of like either black or white which i think is like yeah. very neat uh symbolically because it's kind of like the duality of her character uh yeah. which which we've talked about before because they like she's got the the layers on she's got like the black jacket later on with the the white mm-hmm. shirt underneath and that's kind of like mm-hmm. comes right around the time where she she kind of transforms like after Randy's death where you know, Dewey says, like, you know, is this another Gale Weathers ploy? And she's like, you don't see any cameras, no cameras here. here. I swear to find yeah. this fucker. And yes. <laughs> which is such a great line. And then, and then of course, after when they go into the, uh, uh, like, the, the auditorium, and then she she removes the jacket, and it's kind of like, that's like she's one of the good guys now. She's she's yeah. she's joined the Scooby gang, if you will. Um, yes. and, and from that point on, like, she, she's always going to be part of the group. Which, which yeah, I, which and I we, like. we, and yeah, we, I don't think we, uh, even you know, notwithstanding like her, 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 
you know, moving in to position at gunpoint in the finale of uh, the movie, whatever yeah. <gasps> moments we may have. Um, <laughs> uh, the second she shakes her head no, yeah. you know, because like Sydney even, doesn't she just like, Gail, in this accusatory voice. Yeah. The second Gail just kind of shakes her head, I'm like, oh, there's someone behind her! You know, I'm such a bitch when it comes to this movie. <laughs> but, um, and this isn't even my favorite finale, but that moment fucking works for me. Oh, the Mrs. Um, Loomis just the fact reveal... Let's yes. just talk. Let's just talk about Laurie Metcalf here, because this. Oh, okay. Because I was just watching this, um, uh, like just a little bit right before. Actually, this is funny. I did, you know, as I always do. I try to watch it, um, like the night before, and and I always end up falling asleep. And um, Sarah yeah. uh, Campbell, was it Sarah Campbell? Yeah. Uh, posted a a comment today and just like every every one of these podcasts is always the same it's uh, like uh you do, doing your introduction or something and then me always like talking about how i fell asleep while i tried to read <laughs> <laughs> but uh i know i was just just sort of like on my computer here just rewatching that sure. moment and i just like i love like i i eat the shit out of that moment where where Mrs. Loomis does come in because you don't know that she's Billy's mother yet. And it's just like this look and she kind of, mm-hmm. she, she turns her head and like looks at Sydney like, like, huh? And, <laughs> and then you just, you have like, she's just like, Mrs. Loomis? Yes. And I get chills. And then you have Mickey just like, Billy's mother. Oh God. Don't. And, um, <laughs> I just we'll get into all I that. love but yes, I, I agree. yeah I, like everything about uh, like that because I mean this is the thing like th- why I really appreciate Mrs. Loomis as a killer is mm-hmm. because she is like a hidden in plain sight killer she's not obvious yeah. and that's maybe that's just me that's like what I like in murder mysteries like I like like it's the, the, the Agatha Christie style it's it's usually the person you least suspect. And not always the, the person you least suspect, but the one that you don't think about, because that's what makes a good killer, because they're able to misdirect you and have you thinking that everyone's a suspect except for you. Um, mm-hmm. And even going back to, and like, I don't want to spoil like other movies, but it's like, it's like, this is not the first time we've seen a like psychotic mother, you know, turn out to yeah. be the killer. I mean, like Friday the 13th, obviously, but that's not really a murder mystery uh in a sense of like how this is um but just just the fact that you know we have this character and all we really like kind of get from her throughout is like it's this obnoxious reporter who i mean as far as i knew i like she because she would just come in and out and i didn't really suspect that she would ever be involved in like a a larger capacity than what she was and even at the end i thought like you know when she does run into or gail runs into her at at the end there i'm just like Oh, she's just going to be like a bystander watching at the end and just being like, oh, well, I'm going to she'll be like the the LL Cool J character in H2O when she'll you'll just see her walking by the screen, calling her husband or something and just being like, I'm guess what? I'm quitting reporting. I'm going to I'm going to write a book or just like that that would be like (laughs) her trajectory. So like bravo to, you know, Kevin and Wes for deceiving us that way, because I yeah, I would never see that coming. Another clue just occurred to me, though, mm-hmm. with uh, Debbie Salt is when she, because um, she's the one who plants the seed. Because there are a lot of seeds planted in this movie uh, yeah. that, like, kind of like the whole when they finally identify like the Maureen and Phil name, you know, parallel of like the, you know, and the killers killing, you know, the characters in the order that they died in real life in the Woodsboro murders. Mm-hmm. So, and then as soon as they discover that, it immediately gets discarded, you know, and it's no longer true. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for it. There is a justifiable reason for it. But one of the things that um, gets planted that actually does pay off at the end mm-hmm. is planted by Debbie when she says, I, you'll know the line better than I do, when she just says, I was just thinking that if, you know, someone is repeating the killings of Woodsboro, that they might actually be from Woodsboro. That's all. And she just goes off. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the fact that she's she's yeah. the one planting the seeds, somebody from, the killer's probably from Woodsboro. She's the one from Woodsboro! Yeah. She's standing and she's just like... And just the fact yeah, that I'm she's, because like, like, I love like that scene just because you know that she's, like when you watch it uh, in hindsight and you're just like, I see what you're yes. doing. And all those other yes. reporters, they're like, 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and she just, she, yeah, she does that. She turns around. She's like, that's all. And turns around. Yes. And you can just see her. She's like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> yeah. That's what she's doing, like, behind her back that we can't see as yeah. she walks away. But, <laughs> but, and, but another thing, because they, they have the, the bit there where um, when Gail and Dewey are just like, is it possible? Like, because they, they have Jules' recordings and they're just like, wait, if the killer's been, like, watching us this whole time, like, they're, like, maybe we can see them on this, the tapes here. They've just been, like, mm-hmm. relishing this. Um, and she's literally there. For everything, like every time they they walk out of the, the the police station, she's you know you see her in the background there, just kind of like waiting yeah. to you know swoop in and and um, rile up Gail with her her questions or or comments. Yeah, I don't know if you and I ever talked about it either, because I don't know if I ever noticed it before. Sometimes you know my I'm getting old, my memory's getting bad, but mm-hmm. I did notice either for the first time or the first time that I can remember. Um, the phone call that um, it's been established by you and I, we're in agreement that um, Mrs. Loomis was the ghost face who killed uh, Randy. Right. Um, as she confirms later in the movie. And I'm like, yeah, I believe her. Why, yeah. why would she lie about why? that? Why? Yeah, but, exactly. Um, and also, why would she go off script unless she were going, <laughs> really? You're going to say that about my son? Mm-hmm. But... Um, that's just how I imagine her behind the mask. <laughs> but um, uh, but um, uh, 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 for the first time, I noticed in the phone call, because I believe she's the one who's on the phone with him too, because otherwise what's the motive for killing him mm-hmm. uh, the, other than hearing what he says about Billy? <clears throat> um, she says, you know, like, uh, you're, you'll never blah, 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 blah. I don't remember the whole line, but it ends, punctuates it with, and you're never going to get the girl. <laughs> and I'm like, Mickey heard him say in class when he was asked like well how what, what, what would you make you know a horror sequel different it's just mm-hmm. like I'd have the geek get the girl Binaka yeah. and <laughs> so it made me think like Mickey and Mrs. Loomis are lit are literally comparing notes about like mm-hmm. th- this is who they are this is their background this is who they think they are in the movie so we can use this when we talk to them on the phone and everything like that yeah. and I just thought like so she's really trying to get at his psyche and that's why it works that's yeah. why I opened with fuck you mm-hmm. because I think it's the line that I feel the most the yes the I'm movie. right there with you I, I mean that is <laughs> my that my is headcanon audience. is that because I don't think that Mrs. Loomis gives a shit about Randy one way or another I don't know if he mm-hmm. was ever I mean he, he might have just been like uh, by association uh, like on their their kill list yeah. Um, and, and you know, like same with Dewey, but again, like they, you know, they wouldn't have known that Dewey was going to be there. He just kind of showed up uh, of his own volition. But I, I always just believed that like the two targets of Mrs. Loomis were Sydney and Gail because at the end of Scream One, is you know we see that they're the ones that kill him. Like Gail doesn't kill him, but she does shoot him uh, right before he's about to stab Sydney, and then Sydney finishes him off with the bullet in the head. So. Of course, Gail would write about that in the book, and and uh, Mrs. Loomis, who I'm going to call Nancy, Nancy Loomis. That's that's the the canon that Kevin had uh, Nancy. intended. So it's not Debbie Loomis. Like she's not uh, going to use her real first name with no. a with a fake last name alibi. Don't be ridiculous. So I yeah I think that <laughs> she's not a Charlie's Angel. Go on. I think that, <laughs> I yeah that's I, all I they fully did. believe like she read that book and she just you know, got angry and was just like, yeah, I'm going to kill these bitches. And there's even another line where, uh, you know, when she does first introduce herself to Gail, we find out that they have met before. Well, they haven't met, but she was like, she's like, oh, I took your seminar last year in Chicago. I was Mm -hmm. the one in the front row asking all the questions. And Gail's like, oh, yeah, I thought you looked familiar. Like, Like, Gail already knows her and is just like, oh, (laughs) she's already annoyed by her. So that just goes to show, like, how long Mrs. Loomis has not only been planning this, but, I mean, at that point, she probably would have already had, like, the liposuction and plastic surgery or or whatever it was that... You know, she she apparently yeah. got a done. lot of work later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fifty pounds and a lot of work. Sixty pounds and a lot yeah. of work yeah. later. <laughs> Sydney's That's so another bitchy. line that I enjoy. Yeah, she's. So I bitchy. love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, she is pissed by that yeah. point. Like she has nothing to lose. Yeah, no. But totally. um, um, but um, uh, 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 it's it, it, we haven't talked about her yet, and I just wanted to like kind of really go into Sydney if we could. Are you, or can we do that? Uh, yeah, for sure. 
I'll allow there's it. There's not much to say. There's actually, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> um, there's not much to say, actually, though, because, really? I mean, I love the way that she opens up. I love the fact that she's getting a crank call. A, a, a crank? A prank call? I think what, either applies. Crank or prank. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> a crank call. Crank call. And, um, but she's just taking... She's just taking it in stride and, you know, like she knows, like, you know, even like, you know, like what, what, what sanctions they're violating or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, just like, hope you enjoyed the movie. And she know, and she's not even like, should we change the number again? You know, Hallie asks her and she's just like, nah, it's just opening weekend. You know, it'll probably die down, you know, like yeah. later and everything. But I love that. So she's not necessarily haunted by everything. Like she's not, she's not jolting, you know, mm -hmm. like Maureen was in the, in the lobby of the theater. But She's still given pause, like, because the, the first thing that really does kind of, like, reach her is just seeing Cotton Weary on television talking about his innocence and shit. Mm -hmm. And so there's still, like, a layer of guilt. She's still, you know, she's still, she's still Sydney. She still remembers everything. She hasn't, she's moved on, but she hasn't moved past everything, and I yeah. appreciate that. But um, she's still largely trying to kind of, you know, everything she says about Dewey is in a very kind of, like, don't worry about me. I've got a part in a play. I love acting, and I'm seeing a guy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, like, everything is so... And it's not even just, like, don't worry about me, but it's very sunny. Yeah. And it, it's almost like, that was a terrible part of my life. Yeah. But it's over, and now the rest of it is going to be great. She hasn't accepted her fate quite yeah. yet. This is what the movie is yeah. for. Yeah, I think that... I mean, well, first of all, I, I think that, like, every time... Uh, like Nev Campbell comes back into the character. She, yeah. what she does so well is that she paints a a portrait of this person's life that we have not actually seen. So I mean, like, yes. uh, like I guess there's two years that pass between uh, yes. Scream and Scream Two, and yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I I would say that she's like there is like maybe a little bit of denial there. Like she's, I don't think that she is yeah. completely. Uh, secure in everything. There's there's always this lingering doubt, and it is kind of like you know when she's telling Dewey about like all the great things in her life. It's almost like she's fooling herself because Dewey, Dewey even says like you know I'm just I'm just like you know want you to be careful, and she's like don't you think I know that like she it's 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 just part of her, her the mask that she wears, you know her mm. her her ghost face mask if you will. Yeah. <laughs> um Aww. that uh <laughs> yeah, like that she's she, she's clearly grown from this. She wants to move on and there's all these things that are happening in her life that are that are not allowing her to do that. Like the 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 release of the movie and obviously Gail Weathers is kind of like at the forefront of that cuz Gail is like still this like antagonistic figure in her yes. life who's creating this attention that she doesn't like. And and that's mm -hmm. I mean, the, just sort of like the relationship of, of those two characters over the course of the franchise is another thing, like in and of itself, that you like we could talk about it for hours on on a pod. But uh, yes. yeah, for here, it's just like I like I love like when we do first get to see Sydney see Gale, and and they're just like uh, Randy's like, look, it's Gale Weathers, and. Uh, I forget what he says, or he, he's like, "Oh, soon to be the major motion picture starting starring Gail Weathers." And Sydney yeah, right. is the one who says, "Like, be kind. She saved our lives." Right. But it's almost like reluctantly, she's just like, "Yeah, she." It's just like you saved our lives, but you also like kind of put our lives in peril, <laughs> so, so to speak, just with with your like media hungry fame shit. So right, right, when we right. do, when like they do, kind of when she comes up behind her and just like, Hey Sydney, I just wanted to get uh, uh, an interview with you. And she's like, yeah. hi Gail, what do you want? Like, it just like, there's yeah. nothing left for it. Like we already, we've been through this shit. There's nothing left for yes. us to, to kind of yeah, discuss. Yeah, that too. She's, um, it's almost like she, even though she still remained in touch with Randy, obviously, because they both went to the same school. And even though there's this wonderful heartfelt reunion between her and Dewey, um, and with Gail, there's still trepidation and like, yeah, like a sense of finality to like what happened. And it's just kind of like, what, what's going on? So, and then when De Gail turns it on and brings Cotton in front of a camera, I also mm -hmm. noticed, I think for the first time, how incredibly camera conscious uh, Cotton was. He when he does that, he, he says and, that line and then like looks over at Joel. He did like, it twice. He, he kept looking in. <laughs> yeah. He kept saying things and then looking into the camera and I'm just like, oh my God, you did piece you get of shit. Did you get that on camera? <laughs> 
yeah, I got that on film. But um, <laughs> I love the fact that he, um, I, I love the fact that even though like I do feel for this man because there is a sense of desperation after you've been accused of murder yeah. and everyone believed you did it. There are people who long after you've been exonerated who are still going to believe you did it, you know, like who <laughs> yeah. don't watch the news or who don't. Give I mean, you can only hear remember. the Richard Gere gerbil story so many times. <laughs> 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 before you actually start <laughs> believing it yeah. but um exactly and he, I, I so i get the dust where the desperateness is coming from and i think leah schreiber plays that really really well mm-hmm. but the fact that gail would be so incredibly calculated and underhanded because she would know what that would do to sydney and she wants that she yeah. wants it on she, she wants, wants it on the film. ratings <laughs> yeah yeah She's she's got to write another. She's got to make another book. She's got to make you know. She got to keep Gail Weather's name before the people. I dropped my pen. But she. <laughs> um, but um, okay. So I, I don't know how much more there is to say about Sydney at this particular juncture. If you have any more, because I'd like to. Move um. Well, to I was just gonna say, like you know, going into because I, I I definitely feel like this movie. It does kind of. Uh, it's kind of separated by the two factions, the Sydney storyline and the Gail storyline. And I definitely I follow the Gale storyline a lot more. Like, I think that that's where the the movie's at its best and a lot more interesting. And not not to say that I don't yeah. like any of the stuff involving Sydney because she does have, like, a lot of great bits. Like, you know, there's there's obviously the 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 scene with her and uh, what's-his-face who, um, from The Omen, you know, actors. Oh, uh, David Warner. Yeah, David Warner. where, you know, it's it's almost like, it's, it's kind of like the Laurie Strode fate conversation yes. but it's 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 that's because that's kind of like the beginning of her realization of just like yes i am a fighter and i love how she's yeah. like yeah i'm a fighter he's like i didn't i don't believe you don't she's believe like you. i'm a fighter and just like nope nope i'm yeah. a fighter and he's like yes like yes. use that <laughs> and i love that scene because it's just like he's like he like he's barely in the movie but it's just like yeah. i like just little character moments like that, I appreciate more. I'm not so much attached to, um, like Hallie and Derek. They just feel like, kind of, 2.0 versions of you know characters that we've already seen, you know, do it better. I don't think that they're mm-hmm. bad, and you know, the, the, we'll probably when we get to the cherry picker, like I'm gonna have a really hard time uh, with this because, because I like every single person in this movie, like they're like oh. everyone it does a great job. Uh, but there's definitely the, like, there's stuff with Sydney that I just feel like it's, it, it could have been a little bit more. I mean, there could have been more of like the stuff with Sydney, like with the play mm-hmm. and less about like, just like not just to, to shit on the cafeteria scene. Cause I know like that's, everybody's you know biggest thing uh, which i don't even think is yeah. that bad I, I i mean i definitely agree that like you know if they they could have removed stuff like that and you know given us more dynamic things with with sydney and the other characters but it just felt like we repeated that same scene of her kind of like back and forth with derek it's just like i think that you know it would be better if you know we didn't see each other to them being like okay we're gonna see each other and then like no you need to have your distance and it just like none of it like really uh, was consistent because then he's waiting for her outside of the dorm after they already had that conversation where uh, yeah. he, she's like, I just need space. So, I mean, obviously Randy was had just been killed, but still it was just like, it just felt like we're do, we're treading the same ground with Sydney throughout the movie. Um, other than the scene uh, with like the Cassandra scene, uh, which mm-hmm. even like of itself, like the, the, which I still think is Mickey uh, dressed up in the ghost face mask and the and the brown robe, tormenting Sydney cool. on the stage because you can even see them the like s- swirl around and run off. But you know, whatever. We'll never we'll never see eye to eye. on That's this. fine. You know, I I enjoy being right uh, anyway. But um, <laughs> yeah, like I, I don't think it's not until the end. It's not until really like the the big car crash scene, which is that is actually you know if we're talking about scary stuff. That scene, mm. the suspense of, of that is just like, I don't know if it still has the same effect on me today because I've seen it so many times. I know the outcome, but like you, you, you can't deny that with the first time you saw that, that was a nail biter. Oh, I still, just the <clears throat> swell of the Beltrami score as she 
pushes through the window finally like mm-hmm. everything leading up to it like if i'm if i if i want to sit down and watch it i can totally get into it but i can also do laundry to it but when she i always go oh just because the nah, nah, you know <laughs> she's like it's just so harrowing like it is so incredibly manipulative in the greatest way yeah. because I don't know. It just delivers. The car, because- <laughs> the horn going off. Yes. That just yeah. like adding to it. And I think that that's another brilliant thing. Cause I mean, like a, a, a scene like that could have been so contrived in any other uh, movie, but here it's just like, no, this is a police car. So the back doors um, are not going to open uh, be- yeah. because they're locked. And then the other side is, is pushed up against that wall. So they can't get out. So yeah. it's like, they, they, did that really well. And just considering that, I don't even know if that was in the initial script, uh, at least the one that yeah. I, I had read. So, you know, like mm. clearly just with, with the, the timing of how soon this movie was, was written and then, you know, went into production. And then of course, like the rewrites because of, of what had leaked on the internet. Uh, yes. If, if yes. that was added in last minute, like that, I mean, that's one of my favorite scenes of the franchise. Um, did did you ever sure. read the screenplay, any edition that had Hallie as the killer? Because she was one of the original killers, right? The the only thing that I really remember, and I don't know, because there's speculation of just um, oh. that it was like it was a dummy script that they had purposefully oh. made after the fact. Nice. But the the like the biggest thing that I noticed is that Randy wasn't actually a student at the school, and he was he was Gail's cameraman. And Joel was the oh. student um, oh. who it just felt like a very throwaway character. Like he didn't have much. And I don't even remember. I think that he died, but it was like an off screen kill. Um, oh. But um, yeah, it did turn out it was it was Derek and Hallie. And then they were working for Mrs. Loomis. And Mrs. Loomis was the, of course, then did the whole thing where she like kills them. And then Cotton comes in. And then Cotton's not, like, part of the plan, but then he, like, seizes the opportunity to kill Sydney, And it sort of ends on this cliffhanger. And then, like, that, that script that I read is basically, like, Kevin Williams and just being like, and then we'll figure the rest out later. Mm. So, so I don't know, like, I, I don't know oh. what's, what's real and, and, and what's not. But um, okay. definitely, like, reading that script, because there is a lot um, that, you know, you even, like, you look at it and just like, oh, this would make a really crappy movie but like literally when when kevin puts the notes into the script like west will make it scary west will make it scary like west mm-hmm. knew what he was doing um mm-hmm. so yeah and, and this cool. scene is a prime example of that but uh just just finishing off what like what we're talking about with sydney i yeah i feel like like her her kind of arc meanders throughout the movie but it's uh Definitely in the end, because I feel that like what, and this is, you know, why I I really like Mickey, because what he does to her, like that, that uh, psychological trauma that he inflicts upon her is really kind of what sets her, her role up in the next movie. And kind of like, as we're talking about every time that Nev Campbell comes back and just like, uh, dives back into the role. And I don't know how many years, like, I can't remember past between two and three, but there's like basically everything that she's dealing with in that movie is because of, you know, where we ended up here. So she's, it's, you know, just like in terms of like the original trilogy, like her, uh, just, just how she evolves or or transforms as a character that yes, Mm -hmm. she's not, she hasn't like really, uh, entered into that, that moment until the end of the movie when she, when she takes the gun and shoots like the just in case, uh, bullet yes, into into yes. Mrs. Loomis and then just like throws it uh, aside like when she you know finally does become the 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 Linda Hamilton as uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as Mickey says but it's Mickey, yeah. yeah it's not until it's like she physically she's there by the end of this movie but it's not until like the end of the next movie that like emotionally she's like I'm gonna be okay like I you know I'm gonna be yeah good. that's um. W- We've talked off pod about just like the ending of this particular movie, which I'll jump to and then we'll jump back very quickly. But just because mm-hmm. it's Sydney, Sydney is the last thing we see walking out of the school. And I always felt that um, the only reason it's upbeat is, is I mean, she did survive. Okay, yeah. great. 
And she did just pass off the cameras, which mean nothing to her. They're actually more of a hassle than anything. She gets to pass the baton to Cotton, mm -hmm. who couldn't, you know, be more just like seething, you know, not yeah. seething, but like, you know, like mouth watering for some <laughs> attention. So it's like, oh, now finally I get my attention. I get my 15 minutes and I get my Diane Sawyer interview. But um, <laughs> it's going to make a hell of a movie. Yeah. But um, and then we just see her walk away with this kind of, I don't know, it's not even, I guess I'll call it contemporary triumphant music. <laughs> Collective and, Soul, the song is called She Said. Yeah, yeah, and just, but it's just with the few keys that they have as she's like marching across the lawn and yeah. everything like that. She's completely alone. And then you start, what happens to me every time is I start to realize mm -hmm. how many people have died and how much, you know, more just aftermath awaits her. So I'm not left so much with a, she's going to be fine. It's more like a, yeah. she made it again, if you listen to the music. But if you played any other kind of tonal, you know, tonally different music, if you would have mm -hmm. played something that was more kind of like, lonely or tragic or even scary like yeah. you know you, it, like scary in well, broad daylight i would have bought it the no, no, no i agree and i don't i don't mean to say she's gonna be fine i just meant like she she's there yeah, physically like she if, you yeah. know if, if if someone's coming for her she knows how to handle herself now but she's you yeah. know at that point where she's now has to look over her shoulder all the time but no i totally agree but at the same time, like, I really love it. Like, I just, because I mean, it, it's it's so 90s. Like, the music <laughs> selection that they have in this it in is. this movie, like, I, I love everything. So I don't, like, it, the, the Collective Soul song at the end doesn't bother me as much because I see it more of, like, a nostalgia thing. It's just like, oh, it's so of the time. And, mm. but I do, I do look at that and, and it, it's very ironic. And I don't know if, like, that was just, you know, Wes Craven or, or you know whoever uh, was in charge of just like what the the music uh, choices was going to be just like yeah like I think it'll be a, it, it's just like a funny little way to end it um, but originally right. I guess like one thing that was included in the script is that there was going to be a third ghost face killer standing in the oh, bell tower watching her and that was kind of like oh, what the no. like the original like shot was going to be like up to them and then they decided or you know like the, the producers decided like no we want more of an upbeat ending so that does lead me to believe that maybe it was the wine scenes who were just like so put, yeah but let's, let's just put an upbeat song in there for because they don't they don't fucking like it could have it could have gone either way if, if yeah. the camera would have pulled back just a little bit further we would have seen a ghost face yeah. or michelle Pfeiffer which i guess would have been roman the you know like <laughs> <laughs> say michelle pfeiffer's catwoman <laughs> Yeah, you yeah. know, like this isn't Batman. We would have seen like the silhouette of the know. ghost face. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Pop up. Just rise up and, uh, and just looking dead. That's what I got from yeah. from what you just described yeah. to me. But okay, I'm glad that in that case, I'm. I guess I'm glad I, they went with whatever they went the with because soul, it's not as yeah. having a ghost face watching her is just so bleak, and that's not what this saga is for. Yeah. But um, speaking of which, mm -hmm. okay, so. We, we touched on Sydney, um, and you already made mention of it, but I'd like to elaborate further. This movie is Gail's movie for me. Agreed. Her arc is by far the most interesting because of where she starts and also where she remains for a while in the beginning. She is stewing in her greed and her ruthlessness and it's 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 antagonizing people who she cares about, mm -hmm. who care about her, who want to care about her, or who even just kind of want to be able to trust her and not have to be watching their back all the time, expecting, okay, I'm going to bring that guy you sent away to prison, you know, like right here in front of a camera. What do you have mm -hmm. to say? Um, America is listening. <laughs> I'm a bitch. But um, I love the fact, because there's even the, the way she interacts with Joel... Um, before he reads uh, her her book, yeah. um, I think it's when they get to the sorority, and um, I don't even remember what the exchange is. I just remember this ice queen face she makes. She the says, way "Don't she fuck with at, me." Yeah, yeah, and just the way she looks at Dewey, and then the way she looks at Joel, and just kind of like walks away like this ghoulish person. Yeah. And I'm just like, Gail, come on, mm -hmm. you're better than this. I mean, you weren't perfect. But you can't. I mean, but they the had to. I mean, they us. couldn't just like she couldn't just automatically be like oh, enter into that because like you know we had the the, yeah. the the scene in the first movie of just like Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, and, and I'm not. I am not criticizing their use of Gale in this movie. I actually yeah. really really like it. But as an audience member, I still watch it and just go, damn, you know, girl, yeah. come on. And then so finally when. 
even just like um because she does i don't i can't i always forget she loses her jacket at a key moment and i feel like it might be but might not be the moment uh earlier before she's with dewey in the throes of passion and yeah. the full transformation yeah she takes happening. it off when they're when they takes... they do the the desk thing yeah the de- okay, they okay, were making okay, love on the desk while <laughs> while the young boy drowned. <laughs> no, but but she does it at one point earlier where she's just in the white shirt. I don't she I don't think we see her un you know unsheath it, but mm-hmm. I think she's just um, in the shirt. And I feel like I want to say it might be the moment, but even if it's not, she's wearing a black jacket with like a white pattern on it. So yeah. there's still a little you know like some kind yeah because there's the strobing on. effect on if you ever watch it on yeah, like VHS yeah, yeah. or DVD. <laughs> But whatever it is, she's got, like, uh, an implication of white, at least, when the first time the reporters are going after her and she's, and they're talking about Dewey, like, you know, like, do you think he knows what he's doing or whatever the fuck they're speculating about? She's just like, Dewey is, you know, and she gives a long list guy, of, like, his virtues. She's a good guy, not like virtues. some of us. Yeah, he's a good guy, not like, not like us, not like some of some us. Some of us, just like, yeah. Exactly, and I'm just like, that's the first moment where I'm just kind of like, okay, so you dislike what you're doing, You come on, Gail, you can do it. And then finally, when we get her back, yeah. is the, I just want to get this fucker. And then, okay, so I'm already on board with her, uh, and then when she gets, when she and Dewey get to watch the footage of them fighting and everything like that, mm-hmm. I love how embarrassed he looks. Page I love the fact 42. That... <laughs> yes! Oh, my God. Oh, I also love that he insults her streaks. I love it. Because those are my favorite streaks. Those are my favorite Gail streaks. Did he and insult them, though? The I feel streaks. like he, he complimented her. He was like, by the way, nice streaks. He said it with, like, no, a... No, he said it with, That's, like, he said it in a very, like, flirting way. That's why she said, like, wow. Because it's like, wow. I can't figure out... Like, she doesn't say wow. She said well. She's like, well. Well. But no, no, no. But I the got. way she, she... It was almost like she couldn't figure... Like, she couldn't get a read on him because he was still... He clearly, like, this... Because he, he's still kind of, like, into her, but at the same time, he's oh, been burned by her. I completely. No, that's oh, should, always this, what this I should, got. This should be the cherry picker. No, I never Stop saw it. Stop trying to change the cherry like... picker. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I never saw it as anything other than him, like... Like, you know, it's the final punctuation of everything that he's just kind of, like, laid on her. And I always saw her reaction as just kind of like, well, okay, now we're getting personal. Go after my hair. Thanks a lot. That's what I've got. But I don't know. No, I saw, no, because I think that they still wanted to plant, like, the seed there that, like, these two were going to. There was, like, (laughs) sexual chemistry there. No, but I get that. I don't know why you're so, like, against that. No, it was that. No, because I never got that. What I got from is the sexual nature in their push and pull. Like, the fact that they're still locking horns with each other. Honestly, I think that 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 was probably ad lib. I I bet you anything that that Uh David Arquette was just, like, you know, just, like, I want to say something about her, her wig in this movie. Um, that he probably, that, that in the, in whatever the, the finished script was where he's just like, mm-hmm. says this thing and walks off. And then they're like, no, Wes, I want to like come back. And, and, you know, of course, Wes, he's so collaborative with, with everyone. He's just like, yeah, let's do that. And they probably like really liked that take because, you know, maybe they didn't, sure. he didn't want to come off like too, uh, aggressive to her because she wasn't like, like in that scene, like she was like, kind of like just taking it. She was just like. I, you know, I never meant to hurt you sort of thing. So I don't, you know, just to clearly make it seem like, you know, there was still a little bit of softness there in his character that, you know, that that there was an open door. You and I see this scene completely differently. This is probably why you rank Scream 2 lower. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> no, I really like that exchange. Mm-hmm. I just see it in a, I just read it in a completely different way. Yeah. Um, we should ask them. We should ask uh, David Arquette and Courtney Cox, like what they think that moment is. Sure. Let me just call them up right now. Just... <laughs> all right, cool. We'll find out. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Conference call. But anyway, um, so anyway, then moving into like them going into the throes of passion, and I love I love the fact that there's something really wonderful and innocent about it. Like I'm not sitting here going like, oh my god, they're being stupid. They're in a horror movie. They shouldn't be having sex. I'm actually really rooting for them, yeah. even though people are dying all around them. Mm-hmm. I would never root for this, and I shouldn't. But because it's so innocent, and because the purity of like their actual love, I feel is reading. And also, they're yeah. both really really good actors. So it's maybe it's not their love. Maybe they're just really really good at like you know yeah. being that way with each other. Because it should be uncomfortable also because it's a, and they were an actual couple at the time, and watching actual couples like get it on if I'm not like into both of them is uncomfortable for me. Yeah. And I'm it's 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 not that I'm, you know, I don't know if they were a couple at the time yet, but they were definitely there because they got together after the They got together after, but I because I remember like hearing 
interviews uh, where David said like, yeah, like during the, the uh, production of Scream 2, Wes took him aside and said like, look, I know like you guys have something special here and you know, you, you got to do something like you got to make it official. Otherwise, you know, you're going to lose her. So I don't think that they had actually been in oh. like together or been, been in a, a relationship or well they like, obviously shared an attraction let's put it yeah um so whatever but um what it works and then i love i just love the, the the little laugh moment with her his hand on her boob <laughs> <laughs> it was like dewey he's like oh sorry <laughs> no, we're not we're not there anymore okay yeah. i get it um, <laughs> let's click into into action and then it leads into um that whole uh, projector room scene, which is completely still, I have no idea what's going on in that scene. Even though we argued about it in the Who Kills Who, I have no idea. Okay, what that yeah, scene just is you can go about. back and listen to that, that episode, but we're not. Getting, <laughs> yeah, we're not getting into any that. more fucking Who Killed no, 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 Who no, no, or no, what did Dewey saying, feel have, in no, the no, no, moment. No, no. I'm, I'm just <laughs> saying, I'm still, I still watch it and go, I. It's just, it's a movie. It's a movie. I just have to. <laughs> I can't wrap. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then, okay, good. But then we move. But then we move into the recording studio and oh my God, see, that is when the horror really starts for me is just watching her like balance, like, you know, Mm -hmm. like playing, playing with the senses and watching the recognition in her eyes and in her face and then watching her fear and then watching Dewey get, you know, taken, we think Mm -hmm. taken out at the time and everything and the effect that I still cry. I cried this time when it happened again, like again, the swell of the the score. And the fact that she's sliding down yeah. the glass with him, it all feels so incredibly authentic and sad. And I, yeah. oh, well, this I is like, I mean, because it's this, it it's works. this scene and then the car scene back to back. So it's like they, yeah. they like double loaded this, uh, you know, yeah. right in like the pre climax of the movie. And I think like a lot of like the criticism that I, I do hear for this movie is that it's slow and it's boring. Like it's the longest movie, which is two hours, which is not like, that's like maybe five or seven minutes longer than, you know, the yeah. first Scream movie. I don't know what people are taking uh, umbrage with, but um, I think like it definitely pays off for like some of the slower moments, which the thing yeah. is like, I like the, you know, just to jump back, like I like the, the the parts in the middle of this movie because it is, it's kind of like the calm before the storm. And those are like some of my favorite scenes where you do have the, like like the Scooby Doo scenes, if you will, where you have yes. uh, Randy and Dewey together yes. over ice cream. Any time where you have mm-hmm. characters coalescing and conspiring over <laughs> ice cream, this is always a good scene. Um, but they're just talking about like who could the killer be, and then you have the the scene or a few scenes following that of them all out on the the quad, and then just I think the question yeah. here is like, well, who's next if we're going by the pattern? And I just love like the dynamic of like every character brings to them. And then Joel just being like, I don't need to hear about no dead cameraman. I'm going to yeah. I, like, I'm going to go get some donuts or crack or smack, yeah. whatever he says. He's like, and I'll be back <laughs> when you have something more saved by the bellish to talk about. Um, so everyone's like delivering there. And it's just like, this is what I want. Like, this is like, you have all these characters who are still alive I want to see them together and doing what they do best. And that's like, that's what I kind of love about this movie is that they're, they are being proactive. Like they're, they're yeah. in control of the narrative. And just in terms of like being a murder mystery, uh, cause you mentioned this before, like how it was, you, you found it slightly irritating that the, you know, they, they would be making out uh, while they're, they're in the middle of this murder investigation. But I mean, like in their ever, minds, in, yeah, in their in their minds, they're they're saying this is like, well, the killer's not coming after them because it's going after people with with similar names. Like they did go after Randy, or, or mm-hmm. you know, they they killed him. But mm-hmm. everything that happens here, it's it's almost like let's get the killer before they get us, sort of thing. They're just like when they do get the videotapes and like, yeah, we can. We can see if the killer's on here, and even the scene where they're they're at the the police station with with David Arquette's father playing the the police chief, uh, where they're just writing the names on the when they first come to the realization that like oh yeah these are repeating names even though that's that plot line goes nowhere I love the fact mm. that it's still it's a red herring you know it's like you have the characters mm. and they're still mm. discussing it and they're just like what does this mean? And it throws you off. And then it's punctuated by the Marco Beltrami score again, which is like, it, it has that like mysterious 
um, overture of just like, doo, 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 or, you know, however it goes. And it's just like, what is going on? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. I do. And that's what I, that's why I love it. Cause it's like, and I've said this before in like videos, cause I feel like this, I, I associate with like Italian jallos. Because it does, it, it, it feels like, you know, like it, the, a, a murder mystery that could have been like a 1970s uh, Italian horror movie of just like the characters going about. And there's actually like an, a movie like like you and I have talked about before, uh, Deep Red or uh, Profondo yeah. Rosso. There's a lot of correlations between that movie and this movie that I noticed. And like, you know, especially like with the with the like it, to investigator, like the couple which, you know, I see, you know, again, in the scene where uh, Gail and Dewey are going to the, the archives or, or whatever at the end, and the yes. killer kind of follows them there and, and goes after them, and someone gets stabbed and, and whatnot. So, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if Kevin Williamson was, like, directly, you know, thinking of these movies when he had written the, the material, but, I, you know, I like mm. to think that he did because there are a lot of similarities um, uh, with that. So yeah. that's th because of those reasons, like this is my favorite. And, you know, I hope that, you know, like when we get some more sequels that they kind of go back to a formula like this, because, you know, like I think that I'm mean, not to get into Scream 5 or anything, but like the marketing for that movie was it's always someone, you know, you know, they made it seem like this is going to be really like this is going to be a murder mystery. And there wasn't I didn't feel that that Scream 5, Scream 2022 20, really was a murder mystery. I, it just felt like a, like a, a slasher to me. Um, so that's kind of like what's great about this because it's slasher and it's murder mystery. Hmm. I mean, okay, I, I, I understand that. I mean, I and you and I have <clears throat> talked about this before and I guess now is probably the time to get into it mm. uh, since we're <laughs> getting into the home stretch here. Mm. Um, the, the, the main issue, I mean, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of the, I think I love you sequence, but I understand, I actually understand the part it plays just d d a little tangent because, um, everything that Derek does up until then is either kind of like your stock boyfriend stuff, which can go either way. It can either just be like a decent guy yeah. who's doing the best he can, or it can be, a a, a Billy stand in who's just trying to gaslight her again, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, I think I love you sequence kind of makes me not suspect him anymore like there is something kind of freewheeling and i it, it, i won't say it works on me i'm not like oh i'm really glad she has him but i am like mm -hmm. oh she's smiling you know yeah. a day that sydney's smiling i'm smiling so it's not the worst thing in the world okay so when we get to <laughs> when we get to the first ghost face reveal first of all i've heard i've told you this before i think i might have even mentioned it tell everyone too. else yeah that's that's yes fine. just the okay the, what gets her into the theater feels so incredibly random the fact that she'd be wandering around they would know that she's not going to the police they would know she's not even going to go to campus security agreed they the agreed they, yeah uh, yeah they would know the campus is dead at that you know at that particular hour and that she would just happen to wander into the theater because it's making noise and maybe she would because she suspects david warner's in there doing his theatrical magic but maybe she would also <laughs> See, oh shit, somebody's waiting it for me in there. It's a trap. I'm going to call because I've lost my bodyguards. I'm going to call, you know, the cops and let them know I am without protection. You need to send someone. Here's my exact location or I need to keep moving. So you're going to meet me at blah, 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 mm -hmm. Who knows? But she didn't do any of that. She walked into the theater. She walked onto the stage. She somehow got, you know, trapped there. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and then, okay, we get Ghostface moving in and like, you know, the reveal and it's Mickey and everything. Okay. And this is the, this is the thing. It occurred to me again. I feel like I get a new like slant on this every time I watch it and watching it this time. One of the things, and maybe I already said this to you, but one of the things that I realized was I'm watching Timothy Oliphant and I'm, <sighs> I mean, I like his reveal with the thing of, like, I'm going to blame the movies. That also feels very Wes Craven, you know, like, oh, wonderful, so meta. Um, but I just don't feel, given what's come before, and maybe it's not fair to compare this movie to the first movie, but given what came before, I don't think Mickey has Billy's intensity from the first movie, or 
Stu's kind of authentic off kilter quality that Matthew Lillard brought. Like he's he's wacky and goofy and everything like that. But I never doubt for a second that that's exactly who Stu is. I'm watching Timothy Oliphant as Mickey play that, and I just feel like I'm watching a guy pretend to be crazy, and it's really draining. Especially when on the heels of that, when the second Ghostface Killer gets revealed and it's Mrs. Loomis, and I'm watching Laurie Metcalf, um, who is off of her. I mean, her eyes get so wide, and it's so unsettling, and I just love the way she's having a conversation with Sydney, but she's not. Like, she asks rhetorical questions like, you know what makes me sick? And she's not waiting for Sydney to go, what? You know? <laughs> she's like, she just, this is, this is a speech. This is a Mrs. Voorhees speech, whether she's seen the movie or not. Yeah. But she's moving into her role. She's stepping into her power. I love that she's so dismissive of Mickey. It does redeem the movie at large for me. You know, the fact that she's, he's nothing to her, you know? And mm -hmm. even his ideas are stupid to her and everything like that. <laughs> and then I feel like she, she's doles out the intensity of Billy, but also the goofiness of Stu, because one of my favorite things that made me laugh out loud this time is when Cotton comes into the mix. And he's he's trying to assess what's going on. They all are. She's got the the knife to Sydney's throat. And he's just sitting there, wait, 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 wait. And he's just like, he looks at her and he's just he looks at Mrs. Loomis. And he's just like, hi. And she's just kind of like <laughs> does a little does a little nod yeah. and then does, like almost Because they've obviously and, met each other before, because like she was uh <laughs> you know, interviewing him or, you know, questioning. Sure. Yeah. But also the, just the fact that, like, she she doesn't quite know what to make of him. She does a reflexive nod and then, like, a confused kind of brow furrow, yeah. which is like, wait, what? what are, 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 should I be? Should we be friends? Should we? Yeah. Okay. And then she starts to promise him the world. I'll make you a star. You know, <laughs> like, basically is what she's doing. <laughs> she's the devil on his shoulder. And everything about the way that plays out from 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 then on, like, I'm, I'm, I'm on board mm -hmm. with. I enjoy but I feel like Mickey is kind of the weakest link for me in this movie. I, I don't get any pleasure out of saying that. It's just my truth. So, I you know. I mean, I disagree, <laughs> obviously, because uh, Mickey is my favorite killer of any of them. And I not that I, I don't disagree with what you're saying about okay. him, because it's there. But that's kind of what I like about him, because there is no like personal attachment. There's nothing about this character or his relationship with Sydney that means anything. He is a second in command and he knows his place and he's respectful of that to, to Mrs. Loomis um, until I guess the moment where she pulls the gun on him because he does sort of have this like uh, quick reaction because uh, he puts right. the gun up, which ends up shooting Gail. Um, but he, because it's almost like it's, that's what is so intriguing about it because he does get to be like, oh, and who's the mystery guest behind door number two? Or told you I had to, told you, fuck, why can't I, told you I had a partner, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have a partner. But I mean, and you know, that's, I wrote something down while I was watching him yeah. play his scene and yeah. everything like that. And, and it's, I think it's the real, the core of like what, what irks me. I, I know I keep harping on it, sorry. But it's just Billy and Stu didn't pull off their teenage boy masks and suddenly become big bad villains. They just became extensions of who we suspected mm -hmm. they already were throughout the movie. Well, yeah, okay. Well, can I yeah. can I continue? Go go for it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's Sorry. A, no, that, no, that's okay. Well, because um, there definitely is a separation between Mickey the character and Mickey the killer. Because I don't think that sure. Mickey the character is anything special you know if the if the movie had played out and like a, like originally you know mickey had not been the killer if that was part of the the thing i'd been like what a forgettable like nothing person uh mm -hmm. in this and that's almost like why i feel like it is good that he's not overused throughout the movie because you know it would have it would have felt wasteful it's just like why are we seeing all of this shit like it, it doesn't matter but what I like about Mickey is that, you know, when he is on screen, everything that he does, and, you know, this might make him a little bit more obvious, uh, but everything he does and says is in context with, mm. you know, who he is revealed to be. So, you know, you have sure. the scene when he's just like, 
you are not alone, Sid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like, and and, yes. and and just like, why would anyone go back in that house anyway? But just like constantly planting the seeds. With, There's one yes. thing I don't get when he's Stirring like, the pot. when he says like, has anyone looked at Randy? He seems a little odd or, or just like compares him to Dahmer or something. <laughs> like, because that doesn't make any sense in, in just in terms of like him eventually... Uh, revealing yeah. himself to to be the killer with with what his plan right. of you know taking it to a trial, um, but everything he does is just like you know he's he's manipulating her and he manipulates Sydney mm. better than anyone else can because I mean and, and again sure. to jump to the other movies, Sydney doesn't like. Billy and Stu obviously well maybe more so Billy because I never really felt like Stu was capable of inflicting any harm on Sydney psychologically like maybe physically but even by the end of that movie where he was bleeding out it was just like him running out of the room there i'm just like you you got this like take take it home girl um whereas like even like mrs loomis like when she's spouting off all of her her crazy rhetoric sydney's just like yeah and and like yeah you did a bang up job i mean she's she's pacifying her but she's also being condescending at the same time Totally. Even with Roman in Scream 3, she's kind of like, and, you know, Roman is a formidable foe in, like, physically for her, but, like, just in terms of, like, all of his, like, caterwauling, she's just like, I've heard this shit before. And, you know, by the time we get to Scream 4, it's more, like, with Jill, it's more disappointment, but it's like, she's never, like, nothing that Jill says or does to her ever feels like it's it's affecting her. It's not getting under her skin. And we've seen five cream. We know what those killers mean to her. So with, with Mickey and Billy, you know, cause I'll, I'll throw Billy in there too. Like they're the only ones that really fuck with her and like really have an effect mm-hmm. on her. And that's like going back sure. to what I said is like everything that like from the end of this movie going into the third one, where she ends up is because of what had been inflicted upon her by by Billy, you know, originally, but, like, especially Mickey in this most recent installment. So I see Mickey as, like, he knows who he is. He knows what his role is. He's not trying to, like, I don't see him as, like, when he goes crazy that it's, like, you know, he's not being that same character anymore. I see it more of, like, Mm. like Superman Clark Kent, whereas, like, you know, the past killers, like, maybe... um, don't don't give me that look but like you know like (laughs) bruce wayne to batman whereas like superman is superman's real identity and and clark kent is the 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 uh the alter ego the the persona Mm, debatable debatable but go on but i'm saying (laughs) this was in kill bill volume two so (laughs) (laughs) and it has been argued subsequently but anyway i don't i don't i don't know about this argument but i'm just saying that like mickey what who mickey reveals himself as after the fact that is who Mickey is. The per the the person throughout the movie who's you know like the friend of them. Like that's that's Mickey. That's Mickey's idea of like what a real person should look like. That's him like doing the Dexter thing. And I don't think that like you know I said that there's no personal attachment there. I don't think that Mickey hates any of these people. I think he's like you know when you see him in the cafeteria scene and when he's like clapping along, he's probably getting like a kick out of it. He's like enjoying it. And he, you know, he's just thinking like, I, you know, I'm going to kill these people. And it's, you know, like that sucks for them. Cause I do enjoy them at, like on, on my perception of like what like humans should be uh-huh. of like a friendship. But you know, by the time it comes, it's just like, now I get to really have fun and it doesn't really matter mm. what happens. At, but, but just because I was able to fake being your friend so well, I know yeah. who you are and that's how I'm going to manipulate her. And that's how he manipulates yeah. her. So knowing that he's it, like, that's who he is. He's a, he's a killer for hire. And mm-hmm. I, I, this is something I've heard a lot of people mention too, um, that I, I've never even talked about before, but, uh, there's this perception that Mickey is actually killed before, you know, he's already a serial killer. Cause you know, when Mrs. Loomis says, you know, he was, you know, I found him on, on, uh, yeah. The, the classifieds of uh, psycho website, you know, he was on his right, way up right, right. that, you know, like, you know, I, I, I just imagine like the, cause you were talking about like, you know, we, we don't get to see the behind the scenes of the two killers passing off information, yes. but even like the originally when Mrs. Loomis was just like, 
would message him Hi. and just be like, you up, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and he'd so be like, yeah, like, I've, killed, I've killed people before. So you're into what you... Billy Loomis yeah. and Stu Mocker, are you? Yeah. Well, I'm going to say something that's going to blow your mind. I can just imagine what their DMs were like. Yeah. They, or I, I think it was IMs back in the day. It was still instant messenger back yeah. then. But, or the chat rooms, wherever they were. <laughs> but... Um, God, it's taken me back talking like this. But um, I can still hear the chimes in my head. Um, sorry if you're too young to get the reference. Uh, but I, I will say, I, I don't want it to sound like I hate Mickey, because actually I do enjoy everything that he does prior to his reveal. Even the stuff that, especially actually, especially the stuff that incriminates him. Like, I love the kind of like looming... Uh, expression in the moment that you described having the like, video camera alone. like the camcorder yeah the, when he times. moves into shot with the shifty eyes yeah um when the when the new when the news media like first shows up mm -hmm. and and he's like all, oh my god like he's looking like is it my birthday you know he's got this incredible expression just like of anticipation chief hartley said really she was stabbed it. seven drop it <laughs> <laughs> and even the fact even the fact that, like, when Gail first confronts uh, Sydney with Cotton before Cotton is brought on, yeah. you see Mickey see the two of them and take a step back, but you see, like, this kind of, I don't know if his face is low or whatever, yeah. but it's almost like he's trying not to look, but he can't help but look because he's like, holy shit. It's like it started. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then he and has so, his like expression that. because when, when she hits uh, Gail, he's like, you know, yeah, right. He got yeah. like his hand sort of in a fist, and he holds it up to. His I got to face. see it. Yeah. I got to see the thing that happened in the first movie. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I mean, so I mean, I, I do. It's not like I completely, you know, can't enjoy anything that he does. But um, but, but as far as the reveal and as far as its impact, like you know yeah. me, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Like the way I leave a film, like I mean, it doesn't matter how well it's been set up or how well you've handled all of the intricacies at the heart of it. After having watched so many horror films in my career, <laughs> I feel like the hardest thing to stick is the landing. And even though I think this is a successful... Oh, because that's another thing. I ranked these recently just, you know, from like a post from one of the many horror Instagram fans that I follow. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, where you can like put them in the order that yeah. you rank them. And so many people were coming at, at... Not at me, but they were asking me in my DMs just like... So no scream too, huh? You really don't like it because I had it right above the lowest, you know, thing <laughs> that I ranked. And I said, no, no, no. You have to understand. I like all of these movies. Rank it's it doesn't have anything to do with dismissing something. Mm -hmm. It has to do with what do I love yeah. the most? And this one, I love it. I actually do love this movie. But where it when it sticks the landing and the way it leaves me with just like Sydney in a field and little Timmy Oliphant with his ah, just special guest, just surprise cameo, that that just does. for you shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> all that shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like okay, I can walk away. Like I'll go do laundry now, or oh, I'll come mm. back when I know Laurie Metcalf is going to be on the screen, and then like after. You know, Cotton to, says it's going to be a great movie. I don't. I don't stick around for the, for the uh, curtain call at the end. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm usually I out of the room. I, I realized I did it again. So what am I so? <laughs> Although it's like the the speed the sped up punk version. Yeah, the ska version. Yeah. <laughs> ska. So yeah, but um, yeah. So that, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah I was just. Well, I mean, just in case that this fact has not been reiterated, I do not dislike any of these movies. I've you know, Scream mm -hmm. Four is my least favorite, but there are things in, in that movie that I absolutely love, and I don't yeah. discount that. Like this, that's the thing. Like this franchise, you know, even it, at its lowest for me, is still like several rungs above just an average for, I mean like Friday the 13th for example you know like sure there's it's it's consistent but it's also it's mm -hmm. it's consistent in quality but it's also diverse in offering something mostly yes. new every movie so you know yeah. that's that's kind of my my takeaway from it I, I wish more people would see would view rankings as what appeal? What does that say about what appeals to you more, as opposed to liking or disliking? Yeah. I wish well, it could I mean, like, about what's, what speaks to you? you yeah. Know, don't you know? be a toxic I fan. If, yeah. If I don't think. I mean, I like to think that anyone who's listening this th this far into the yeah. podcast isn't. But uh, you know, if you are, sure. just 
check yourself. You know, we all we all can fly off the handle very easily. Um, you know, that, that applies to you to, and I. To, have. Yeah, I, every fucking day. <laughs> And it's harder but, for someone yeah. like me, who it's just like <laughs> there's more people watching me that I have to be careful. But you know, I I respect everyone's opinion, uh, yeah. unless it's you know an opinion that uh, is obviously, uh, shall we say, problematic. But uh, it's you know I respect everyone's opinion of you know what they prefer and totally. i always i mean and i always challenge people i don't even like challenge but i i um question um, not question but um i encourage oh. people to you know oh, if you okay. if you are going to you know have an opinion that differs support that you know and and you yeah. do that very well and that's why you know when we have these podcasts like it, it i i feel like you know you're not just like no no, Nikki sucks because of this. But you're, you know, you're you offer your your opinions, and and a lot of the times, like I do agree with you, uh, you know, and I and I definitely agree with you on the 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 theater thing at the end because that is that is lazy writing, um, probably more so because of the rushed production. But I it it. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, something that, you know, I've criticized in other movies, so I can't not criticize it here. So I definitely mm. feel that, you know, that that could have been tightened up a little bit. Mm. But, you know, uh, in, in the grand scheme of things, Scream 2 uh, is my favorite sequel after the original. Mm. There there might there are even things about this movie that I like more than the first movie. So it's, oh. uh, you know, that's, that's how far up it is for me. Cool. Yeah, cool. Cool. Um, I just I just see like Jennifer uh, Tilly uh, in front of Chucky uh, with, oh, with her <laughs> with the lighter <laughs> with, with like Cow. yeah I, oh I love um, mm-hmm. do you have anything else you want to add to the the scream two dialogue here uh, only thing that occurred to me like for the first time with Hallie again like I'm uh, new things pop out and everything and they're like little microcosmic things but mm-hmm. if Hallie was indeed at one point in a script the killer I feel like there are little remnants left that are kind of like oh you still could have gone that way in a way like with two things in particular they're very they would seem insignificant to most people but I don't know they just I just I can't let it go. I think it's kind of fascinating. But uh, just the fact that she's established really early on as a psych major. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ooh. Because if, if she were a psych major, she'd know how to get into Sydney's fucking head. Yeah. And also the fact that um, there's that one point where it's right after Randy dies, I think. And there, and Sid is at the sheriff's station <clears throat> or wherever, the, you know, the precinct, mm-hmm. I guess. And she's talking about calling his mother and everything like that. And Dewey's trying to take care of her. And she's, and she's just like, you can, you know, you don't have to. So she's something like, you don't have to handle me like glass, Dewey. I'm not going to break. Yeah. And Hallie just says, it's okay to break. And it's really encouraging and sweet, which makes me like her. Yeah. But if she were the killer, I love that the killer, the idea that the killer yeah. would be encouraging Sydney. It's okay to break because we want you yeah. raw and emotional. We and want you shattered. Terrible. Yeah. Yes. So break, break. Yeah. I want to see it. I love that. I, so just that. That's yeah. <laughs> that occurred to me this time. Yeah. I, also, I just because yeah. we didn't really uh, touch upon them, but just uh, uh, Portia de Rossi and Rebecca Gayhart as the, <laughs> the so cartoonish characters. That you know, I, I I just love them for that. And I think like one of my favorite lines in the movie is. Uh, uh, when you know Sydney arrives at the party and Rebecca yes. Gayhart is like Sydney, you made it, and then you get hi. Yeah. No, I really mean that. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's so well delivered. It's so good. You know exactly yeah. who that bitch is. It's yeah. great. It's like mm-hmm. like oh, she's be- she thinks she's being so nice. You know. <laughs> I also noticed uh, in the in the cafeteria scene uh, going back because you do see uh, the the sorority sisters Lois oh, and Murphy yes. there. And also, you you also see the uh, the two obviously the the, the her protective uh, detective police security. Um, yes. Well, and everyone's getting up and applauding. The only people who are not applauding are the two yeah. sorority sisters. So I'm just like bitches. Yeah, they don't really yes. like her. 
um, yeah. so that's a, that was a nice touch. And then another thing, if you look at the um, the two uh, police, the one guy, like I guess the the, the gay one, uh, as yes. Sydney, she's like, but I think he's gay. He's a Gemini. Yes. Um, right. He he's he's applauding, and then yeah. he kind of he looks over at the other guy. And, Officer Richards, yeah, and he just he he gives him a look. I mean, like you can't really see them up close, but he stops clapping and kind of like hangs his head in shame. Um, yeah, so I love that Officer little detail Andrews. from like this wide shot of the uh, the cafeteria of just like these side <laughs> characters just do like adding life to to a scene yeah. and just like to, yeah. to, to, to figures in this movie that don't really matter all that much, but but it just like, it, it adds so much texture. Uh, the texture, I don't know about you know? yeah. yeah. I don't know about you, but I wanted Officer Andrews to turn to Officer Richards at one point and ask, "Harmonica's style is okay, right?" Just to see that <laughs> moment paralleled with the sorority sisters. Yeah. That would have been great, but you know, we, we weren't we weren't that you know that evolved in uh, ninety seven. But um, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, and of course, the gay cop is the first one to die. Uh, that always bothers me. But let's not let's not get don't to ask, it. don't tell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, let's get to the cherry picker. So a new segment that we have with the cherry picker, uh, which we introduced two episodes ago, we like to call the cherry on top. And this is this is designated for who we think is... I mean, not really necessarily the best character, but you know, because I think the cherry on top is, it's just kind of like the decorative finish. So I don't, yeah. you know, we never discussed this, but we have to come to a unanimous decision of, you know, who yeah. we think was the cherry on top. And I'm, a mutual you know, mutual agreement. Mutual. I mean, yes. we're, yeah, we're not going to linger on this too long because we're going to no. butt heads when we get to the, the, the yes. cherry picker. But I, <laughs> I just wanted to throw out one name because I, because I know that like, Gale is our favorite character in this movie, and I think this is Gale's best performance, or Courtney Cox's best performance and, and best outing is Gale yeah. in the franchise. Uh, but, you know, just because she is a character that is, you know, in the entire franchise, um, just to, to throw it to someone unique who's only in this movie, and we, didn't, we haven't really talked about him, uh, is Joel, who oh. is kind of like, because, you know, he... He is just like you know a supporting role, but I mean like let's look at the the benefits of Joel. He survives because he was smart enough to hightail it out of out of town or off of the campus when he saw that you know shit was getting rough. You know he was insightful, like he knew it was happening, and he was funny. And those are those are qualities that I like. And also, he came back when it was beneficial for him. And just like I love his line at the end when he's just like, "Yeah, you and me together, just like old times." It's like you've known her for two days, <laughs> but I still love it. You know. <laughs> um. Oh, see, now this is rough because I I agree with everything that you say, and I do mm -hmm. like Joel. Um. But cherry on top. Of all the characters in the movie, I want to give it to Gale. Gale's like, Gale is the the ice cream filling. <laughs> but she, and the cherry on top. She's yeah. the sundae. She's the, I mean, because also, I mean, okay, let's, if we're talking. Let's give it to, talking, okay, let's give it to Gale then. Because <laughs> then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of, well, what is yeah. the cherry? What does this yeah. symbolize? And but, I mean, and it also just originally that when we, before mm -hmm. we came up with cherry on top, like the term was just MVP. And I'm like kind of stuck on that. Okay. So if the cherry on top is equated with MVP, which I'm assume I, I just don't feel comfortable giving it to anybody other than Gail. She's my. All she right. My I have no problem. I have no problem with that. Okay. Gail is our cherry on top for Scream 2. Hooray! So, last week for the cherry picker, uh, yeah. in Get Out, who deserves to die the most? Get out! And yeah. uh, I said Rose Armitage. <laughs> that's because that's how they say it. And you said Roman Armitage. And Armitage. No, but they I say, said. but no, all of them throughout the movie. <laughs> I, know, they say, I know, I know, yeah. I know. Um, I know, yeah. I'm Armitage. Just like, what's that about? Armitage. Armitage. Maybe if, if there's an Armitage. The, Arma the Armitages. Yeah. The, the Armitages the are Armitages. so good to yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> so good to us. So across they Patreon, like Instagram, and YouTube, and a lot of people showed up 
uh, for this vote. Uh, but we oh, had fun. 401 for Shit. Rose to 90 oh. for Roman. Oh, well, thanks, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for showing up. Yeah, for me. But congratulations, um, yeah. I think that, I mean, well, let's see what, uh, let's see what people are saying first before I, I tell you my opinion on your choice. Uh, Draven says, Jeremy for sure which was not an option, but on Team Zach for this one, Rose is the setup to lure them in. Sure. I mean, I, I you might have had more of a, a fight if you had chosen Jeremy. No. Well, clearly, it, Draven says so, <laughs> you know. You no, I, but that's vote. fine, but no. That's not my heart. That's not my conscience. Mm-hmm. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Neon... Icon says, I feel like you shouldn't say whose pick is whose. Many votes could be biased in your favor because, uh, with all due respect, I didn't know who Eddie was until this. Um, okay. I don't, yeah, I don't agree with that because you've, you've uh, run away with the vote many times. Yeah. Um, I've, yeah. e- and even like on Instagram and, and Patreon, I'll see like, it's just like, where's the loyalty? Because um, you, uh, who did you win? <laughs> you picked... Um, well, I you picked uh, Alex in Ready or Not. You won that sure. one. You won uh, okay. the old guy in X. You won. Yeah, sure. I I'm, don't care. I'm just, I don't remember. I don't care. I'm, but I'm telling <laughs> no, you, I'm making. I'm, I'm just. True. It is total I'm, proof. I'm just yeah. stating the facts. You got. Um, yeah. Who was the guy in The Exorcist? Uh, the the uncle, the, the the shitty uncle. You got yeah. Kalina yeah. in Thirteen Ghosts, uh, and you got uh-huh. Steve Christie. Steve Christie, right, what are you doing the, out in this sure. mess? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I maybe I just win more because I just I just you know know a bitch when I see one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't. I feel have, like I've made you is, feel it's bad. Not, no, it's just the thing is like it's not about like winning or anything like I mean it's yeah. not like I must win against all comes. I don't sit here like you know silently hating you every week that you win, <laughs> you know. I'm just kind of like congratulations, awesome. I understand and especially yeah. if you got to pick ahead of me, it's like, well, I probably would have picked them if I could pick first too. Like yeah. so I in some know, cases in some we cases. Yeah, but we don't yeah. yeah, this isn't this this isn't a competition. It's it's just for jokes, you know. <laughs> It's friendly. It's yeah. It's, it's friendly it's rivalry. Friendly yeah. Diversion. And yeah. it's good. Like it. Yeah, like it's we want we want our nominations to be like we want to represent our nominations. So yeah, that's not going to change. We're not yeah. going to make it anonymous. Uh, but but thank you for the <laughs> feedback. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, and then we, uh, really, we don't care. <laughs> cool. It's just fun. It's just cool. fun, kids. We don't take it that seriously. Coilist yes. says Rose all day. Which I'm, I'm just gonna read as Rose all day. She is the most dangerous, <laughs> cunning one, which I agree mm. with uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, mm. Thomas Baker says I choose Rose and Jeremy. Uh, Heather Marie uh, says for sure Rose. She's used to bait people, and she seems to really enjoy doing so. She gives zero fucks. Uh, and then. Uh, Cody Zombie Wrecker says, this one isn't fair. Come on. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that's that. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's not about fairness. It's just about your heart and your conscience, like, like you said. Yeah, you got to vote. You gotta, I mean, that's the thing. You do got to pick one. Yeah. Like, that's, that's the game. Yeah. yeah. And, y- and like speaking that. of which, the, bringing us to Scream 2, since I, I do get first dibs, this is really hard because, like I said, I don't dislike anyone in this movie. So I was literally going through, like, the background characters. I'm just like, girl in the theater who is like, you know, this is based on a real, like, you know, she was an option for me, definitely. Um, I was thinking about uh, Donnie, like, uh, Cece's sorority sister, because she, um, uh, what did she... Just because she wasn't aware, or she, you know, she wasn't sensitive to to Cece's, um, I guess, just her how fractured she was in in the moment. She 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 wasn't yeah. reading the situation. But again, it's just like, so no. what? That's not on her, you know. So so I you know I couldn't pick her. <laughs> um, 
What was okay. another one that I was gonna? Uh, oh yeah, the, the like frat guy who says, um, where Jarek's like, no, I need to like talk to Sydney. And he's like, nah, 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 my Omega Beta brother, or you know, like the the really drunk guy. <laughs> right. And then I, because yeah, I'm just yeah, like, yeah. oh yeah, him for sure. But then I felt really bad because apparently that guy, um, like he's. He worked on all three movies. He was like a production assistant and he cameoed in all three movies. Um, this is like Wes said this on the, the commentary for Scream 3, but like apparently he passed away like really young. So I don't want to like, I don't want to nominate, you know, him uh, just, no. just just because of that because that seems bad. And then like, you know, even like Chief Hartley, who I just feel like he's such a nothing character. He's boring, but that's David Arquette's father. And he also passed away so you know i'm having a lot of difficulty here um and and another and i really what i was gonna do was was tory spelling but you know as per the rules we cannot uh we cannot uh nominate her so (sighs) this is not on screen in real time (laughs) i'm gonna go with it's gonna be one of the film class students and i don't know if it's gonna be the girl who whose credit is as mopey girl mopey film class girl because she says i had biology with this girl it's just almost like oh way to make it about yourself or do i pick (laughs) film class student number one who we know as joshua jackson because because he he's the one that corrects or he doesn't correct randy but he is he's just the one who's like Hello, the killer was wearing a ghost faced mask. He's direct it's directly responsible. So <laughs> that to me is like the equivalent of like, no, the blood is too red. You know, because I you know, it's, it's more fun to, to pick that so I'm gonna go with Heavy I'm gonna go with head. Yeah, <laughs> film film class student number one. <laughs> The king has spoken. Uh, let it be written. And we know let what your, your pick is. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, actually, we don't. No. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Surprise. Um, my pick is the one who really does annoy me the most on an ethical level. And that's um, David Warner's character, Gus Gold, the director of Sidney's Cassandra uh, play. Just because even though he brings about... One of the most significant moments, I feel, of Sydney's entire trajectory over, you know, the, um, over the franchise, uh, when she declares that she's a fighter. You even reenacted it. I could have reenacted it. I'm sure everybody who's listening or watching Mm -hmm. could reenact that moment, at least from her vantage point. But, um... That said, this man (laughs) has an incredibly fragile or let's put not a fragile girl but a girl a young girl in an incredibly precarious situation that should be handled delicately also students are dropping left and right (laughs) the campus is not a safe place to be at night you know let alone during the day so why would you not cancel the or at least postpone the show until things settle and until the killer or killers are apprehended and then you can put on your precious fucking show no he doesn't have an understudy and he's desperate well you know what that was poor planning on your part buddy she is going through her own personal fucking trauma for the first st- recurring time in, in you know and and like and you're gonna try to tell her to use it to put you know to put it on stage your 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 play your fucking play is not that important and also fuck you for using real boulders apparently <laughs> <laughs> up above in the rafters because they apparently the do end. a lot of damage but apparently it did a lot of damage to, to, to Mrs. Loomis <laughs> as she was starting to crawl up that is that is a safety hazard and I am against that as well wow. so I think he is a reckless irresponsible selfish egotistical man and I so that's why I chose Gus Gold I am uh, shook at I did not her. expect that yeah. uh, <laughs> He bothers me more than Mickey, because Mickey, at least I understand the motive. You're like, okay, he cray, you know? Makes sense. Yeah. Well, uh, vote your heart, vote your conscience. You can vote uh, in the YouTube community section on the, the Cherry Picker. Uh, you can vote on Instagram, uh, if you follow us there, the Cherry Picker Pod. And uh, you can also vote on uh, Patreon if you support us there. Uh, I would love to welcome a new Patreon supporter, Sam Letty. 
So welcome aboard. And Damn. Sam. And I would Sam. Sam. And I would also like to thank Andre Felix for for Yay. editing this, which is coming up on two hours now. So we're we're, we're running a little long. Um, so I'm sorry. Got a I'm lot sorry to about say. that. Yeah, there there's always so much to say when when Scream is involved. Um, but uh, speaking of Patreon, if uh, you are interested and you would like to support us there, we are starting a new monthly thing. We're calling it the Cherry Picker After Dark which is a bonus episode that is exclusive to Patreon. Uh, the first mm-hmm. episode that's coming up, we are talking about cursed films or the the <laughs> idea, the concept of, of cursed films. Um, and we haven't discussed, you know, future episodes or, or stuff, but, you know, we've got lots of ideas yeah. um, you know, yeah. coming up. So uh, those uh, those will be extra uh, for you to see. And if, uh, if you do support us uh, on the $5 tier, that will be available to you. Uh, but uh, if you also want to support us uh, on the one dollar tier, that uh, gets you early access to the regular episodes, such as this one. Uh, so you'll get it uh, mm-hmm. several days beforehand, and uh, you'll also get uh, an extra vote in the poll if that's something that's important to you. If 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 the vote is if the if the cherry picker is important to you, so. Um, right. If if you want, that's that's there for you, and we're we're really excited about the cherry picker after dark. So that'll be coming out later this month, June. Mm-hmm. Uh, d- d- just a reminder for anyone who is listening to this that you can also watch it on YouTube, and uh, for anyone who is watching this on YouTube, uh, you can also listen to it. Uh, where the RSS <laughs> feed link is in the descriptions down below. Uh, we do have an Apple review, uh, Apple Podcast Ooh. review. So, so we, we are we are running really long here, but uh, let's. Uh, yeah, let's... people like it. <laughs> I, they do, as, and especially Blake uh, Hef, Hef, Hefel Heffelfinger. He... I hope I'm saying that right. Um, who says the cherry picker? is one of those rare podcasts that you don't see much of anymore. One that feels like it's just two buddies talking about a movie that one or both loved, hated, or mildly enjoyed, with notes of constructive (laughs) feedback for all filmmakers to make use of. That is where all fans of film can rejoice as they discuss the elements of story, direction, and tone that make the films we see pack a punch or wither away as an afterthought. The two hosts, Zach Cherry and Eddie of Edward is Truth, create an atmosphere (laughs) that is completely entrancing. They deliver an array of personality with Cherry's direct and analytical delivery, paired with Eddie's more excited and whimsical cadence, making each episode as enjoyable as the one before it. Chemistry is the most important aspect to what makes a good podcast, and the cherry picker gets an A+. It is able to find a perfectly stabilized tone, establishing a laid-back and entertaining listen. Must listen for all lovers of film, but most importantly, us horror fans. That Holy is, yeah, yes. that that was a lot. That I mean, that was I don't the best thing to happen to me today. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> it, it, it was amazing. I mean, like I all reviews are appreciated, but uh, Blake went above and beyond there. That that was. That was really awesome, and I and yeah, I, I liked what he said that because I I at least I agree with what he said about you. Um, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> about my end, but I appreciate it nonetheless. That that was really awesome. Yeah, so if absolutely. You, yeah, if anyone else listening wants to uh, go ahead and, and leave us a review there uh, or even rate us, that definitely helps with the with the podcast yeah. algorithm. I don't know how any of that shit works, but. Uh, if uh, but that's you, what they say. Yeah, if you want to find us on uh, Soch, uh, Eduardo, where can they find you? You can find me at Edward is Truth on Instagram and YouTube. Edward is Truth, one word, all run together. How about you, Zach Cherry? Well, you can find me on YouTube, uh, my main channel, just Zach Cherry. You can also find me on Instagram at Retro Bitchface and also on Twitter which I am very active, getting very active on, <laughs> which is at Zach Cherry 8 
So you can you can look for us there. Uh, do you do you know what's going on next week? Oh fuck, I don't. <laughs> I'm so sorry. What that's is going on a, that's next okay. week? Okay, uh, John Carpenter, uh, 40th anniversary. Yeah. Oh, is it the? <laughs> is it me? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, it's cold. You know, like, oh, yeah. okay, so is it The Thing? It is The Thing. The Thing... I guessed right! ...is turning 40 years old this month, wow. believe it or not. So, you know, what a time to, to discuss thing. it, because another one of my favorites, wow. at least, so... A lot of, it's fun. A lot of good movies turning 40 this year. There, a lot of mo- good movies came out in 1982, Hello. Yes. Hel- yes. Hello. It's directly responsible. <laughs> 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 we nice, nice way to end We will be <laughs> right back.